Hey folks, welcome to the Dark Horse Podcast. I have the distinct pleasure of sitting this morning with Jacob Shockey, who is founder and executive director of the Beaver Coalition. Now, many people will not know what the Beaver Coalition is. Uh, I should probably say right at the top that I know you because you were my student and you were Heather's student at Evergreen. How many years ago would that have been? Yeah, uh, 2010. I 2010. Think. That mm-hmm. seems a long, that was a while long time ago. ago. There's been some stuff that has yeah. happened since 2010. Yeah. It's a bit of a different world. In 2010. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, it is a very different uh, and, in many ways, more troubling world. In any case, mm-hmm. welcome to Dark Horse. Thank you for having me. Uh, glad to do it. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot that we might talk about here and uh, many different topics that are interrelated in various ways. I will say that this conversation is spurred by the fact that you came to Portland. You're living in southern Oregon these days. Uh, but you came to Portland uh, while Heather and I and our family were living there, and you walked us around some beaver habitat, and frankly, what you told us blew our minds. We both know a bit about uh, beavers. We were both outdoors people who uh, have encountered them periodically, know about them from, from some academic work, but what you said really changed our understanding of the role that beavers play and have played in North America. And I thought it would be a really good idea to bring that different perspective to a much larger audience. So do you want to say something about um, how it is that those of us who think we know something about beavers get it wrong? Yeah, uh, I'm surprised that it surprised you, but... um, they're not a very, I mean, they're, they're kind of an unassuming animal. Um, for a long time, they were uh, the object of a lot of desire because of their pelts. So a lot of, a lot of people spent a lot of time thinking about beavers uh, 150, 250 years ago. And then for, for a while now, they've been kind of a pest species. Like sometimes they plug culverts. And um, I think what's missed is that uh, for, for thousands of years, beavers were the managers of the freshwater systems of the northern hemisphere and um, they predictably do things which we should get into to the landscape um, for their own needs and yet that predictable way that they garden and build a landscape um, everything else has co-evolved to that as that's how that's how streams look that's how rivers look when when they're under beaver management, that that is, that is the the system that everything has come to expect. And uh, when beavers were absented from that system, it it fell into a state that is very different. And that's the baseline that has shifted away. Um, you know, even the the meandering stream that you imagine as a stream, uh, one can make the argument that that's a bit of a human construction. Um, and so, yeah, I'm curious to hear like what your model was prior to thinking about beavers in, in a, a landscape context. And um, yeah. Well, I've done a lot of thinking in the aftermath of our conversation. Mm-hmm. How could something that has such a profound importance have escaped my notice? It's the kind of thing that I pride myself on seeing and to understand that I had had it wrong caused me to wonder how that happened. And what I've come up with is that the importance of beavers is largely, uh, it's not even historical, it's prehistorical. Mm -hmm. And so I've been living my life in a context that was thoroughly haunted by animals that I was not seeing very regularly. And I think that that's the crux of it is, you know, I I have occasionally encountered beavers in the wild, but not often. And what that led me to to correctly or incorrectly think was that they had always been a minor player and you know punching above their weight class by virtue of the fact that you know a small number of animals can alter a habitat profoundly but my thought was that's taking place where i see a beaver pond and i was not understanding that actually many of the things that are not now beaver ponds have been dramatically impacted by past beaver activity and then further impacted by the removal of those animals both for fur and 
because people had other plans for those pieces of land and they didn't want a large rodent deciding to terraform, you know, their development or whatever it was that they were doing. Our first sponsor for this episode is Mudwater. Mudwater is a coffee alternative made with four medicinal mushrooms. Yeah, mushrooms, plus herbs and spices. With one-seventh the caffeine of a cup of coffee, you get energy without the anxiety jitters or crash, and it's delicious. Each ingredient was added with intention. It has cacao and chai, lion's mane, cordyceps, chaga and reishi, turmeric, and cinnamon. This is a terrific product. You can drink it black or with cream or honey or both. Mudwater also makes a non-dairy creamer out of coconut milk and MCT and a sweetener out of coconut palm sugar and lucuma, the fruit of an Andean tree used by the Inca in the subjugation of their neighbors. You can add those or mix and match a bit of their coconut milk and MCT creamer with some honey from your local bee. The flavor is warm and spicy with a hint of chocolate plus masala chai, which includes ginger, cardamom, nutmeg, and cloves. Try blending it into a smoothie with a banana and ice, milk or a milk-like substance, mint, and cacao nibs. It's utterly delicious. They've got a wonderful new caffeine-free product designed to drink before bed, which is also delightful. Mudwater is 100% USDA organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and kosher certified. Mudwater allows you to build a morning ritual that energizes without the crash. Visit mudwater.com slash darkhorse to support the show and use Dark Horse at checkout for 15% off. That's M-U-D-W-T-R dot com slash darkhorse. Use Dark Horse at checkout for 15% off. Our final sponsor for this episode is Vivo Barefoot, shoes made for feet. Regular listeners are well familiar with Vivo by now, but if you are not, you're in for a treat. Seriously, try these shoes. Most shoes are made for someone's idea of feet, not Vivos. Vivos are made by people with feet who know how to use them. Here at Dark Horse, we love these shoes. They are beyond comfortable. The tactile feedback from the surfaces you're walking on is amazing, and they cause no pain because there are no pressure points forcing your feet into odd positions. They're truly fantastic. Our feet are the products of millions of years of evolution. Humans evolved to walk, move, and run barefoot. Modern shoes that are overly cushioned and strangely shaped have negatively impacted foot function and are contributing to a health crisis. People move less than they might, in part because their shoes make their feet hurt. Enter Vivo Barefoot. Vivo Barefoot shoes are designed wide to provide natural stability, thin to enable you to feel more, and flexible to help you build your natural strength from the ground up. Foot strength increases by 60% in a matter of months just by walking around in them. The number of people wearing Vivo Barefoots is growing. Once people start wearing these shoes, they don't seem to stop. Vivo Barefoot has a great range of footwear for kids and adults, for every activity, from hiking to training, and they also have everyday wear. They're a certified B Corp that is pioneering regenerative business principles, and their footwear is produced using sustainably sourced natural and recycled materials with the aim to protect the natural world so you can run wild on it. Go to vivobarefoot.com slash darkhorse to get an exclusive 20% off. Additionally, new customers get a 100-day free trial so you can see if you love them as much as we do. That's V-I-V-O-B-A-R-E-F-O-O-T dot com slash darkhorse. It was, it was that that I had wrong. I thought mm. that this was a comparatively rare animal and that just simply isn't the case so you want to talk about how common they were yeah well so i come from uh i i've lived a long time in this place called the applegate valley it's uh southwestern oregon and uh the the native folks there called it the spink and i'm probably butchering the pronunciation but that was the tacoma word for this area and uh meant place of the beaver and that was that was the first thing that kind of alerted my attention because there's, it's a similar situation as you describe where there's an occasional beaver, you know, but you wouldn't name it the place of the beaver. And it's it's fertile farm fields. It's a kind of narrow valley with fertile farm fields and, and a river or stream on one side or the other, or maybe the middle, you know, little bands of trees on both sides. Um, not very beavery, right? Uh, but there's a history there of gold mining um this this place there was a huge rush that came in and this valley was full of gold and i got to thinking about that in the context of well this valley was also full of beaver 
and miners use this thing called a sluice box, right? And it's basically a bunch of ridges that catches heavy metal that settles out. And um, sediment settles out too. And so the, this valley is flat and fertile because of this, the aggregate settling out of sediment over thousands and thousands of years behind beaver dams. But those beaver dams in this context were also catching the gold that eroded from the hillsides. And so, you know, the first rush of folks through this area were the beaver trappers. The second rush of folks through this area were the gold miners. And they were, uh, they were harvesting the, the spoils of thousands of years of accumulated wealth behind beaver dams. And that's really what fertile valleys that we farm have done too. We, we drained wetlands and we uncovered this fertility um, but it's the fertility, it's the, it's the vestige of this, this beaver kingdom. Um, and we took streams and pushed them over to the side of the hill and, uh, you know, made them the ditches that we see today. So uh, to unpack this a little bit, mm -hmm. the, you know, we're, there's this cliche about gold and them thar hills. And the yeah. idea really, I mean, let's take it all the way back as long as, as long as we're doing this, right? Gold is not produced by anything here on Earth. It's incapable of being produced by anything here on Earth. It is produced by supernovas, mm -hmm. right? It gets spewed into the universe by exploding stars, and then gravity draws stuff together, not just gold, a small fraction of it being gold. And that gold and silver and platinum and all of the other stuff gets kind of haphazardly molded into some ball, right, a planet, and the point is that planet isn't perfectly flat because there are processes that push some parts up and other parts, you know, erode away. And that results in a process where all of these heavy things are distributed at arbitrary heights and then gravity slowly works them down, presumably into the seas. Right. But if you have a beaver doing its beaver thing, then the point is, well, that actually creates this sluice box. Is that the term? Yeah. So you've got this sluice box being produced by a rodent that has no interest in gold at all, right? But the point is, there's a deposit of gold there that is not the result of the fact that the process of supernovas and then the gravity pulling the stuff of the Earth together, it didn't put that stuff in that valley. Beavers put it in that valley. And so this first place where some huge amount of wealth is the result of this rodent's activity and then, of course, there's a gold rush, which, you know, I've never heard beavers mentioned as an important right. feature of the gold rush <laughs> in my life. But, of course, they were central to it. Yeah, they set the key stage. contractors for thousands of years. There you go. Yeah. Did you say key contractors or pre-contractors, <laughs> right. right? So, anyway, so the point is, I know all about the gold rush. I grew up in California. I didn't mm -hmm. know that beavers were an important chapter in that story. And what I find out is that that's actually the minor piece of it. Right. Right. Gold is one thing, yep. but there's also the fact of the fertility of the West, which is a result of a parallel process that is downstream of, literally downstream of exactly the same activity of this absolutely remarkable rodent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we have an interesting relationship with it because I feel like we look at it as a fellow ecosystem engineer. And there's a bit of admiration, you know, we've got a busy as a beaver and right. all this stuff. But we also have some disagreements around the landscaping. <laughs> <laughs> right. We have not agreed on blueprints. And so when no. it starts architecting, if we yeah. have other designs on that piece of land, we consider it a nuisance. Yeah, yeah it's, tr it's troubling. It's upsetting uh, to our sensibilities. And the thing is, you know, we've, we've taken these flat lands and we've assumed that those flatlands are stable as they are. We don't quite see that these these fertile fields that we've been harvesting that fertility and you know <laughs> food. Um, that's a that's a system that has been degraded to that state. And so I, I spend a lot of my time <clears throat> kind of helping folks with beaver issues. It's because they've then brought in houses and roads and all these various things and they've built it on these vestiges of wetlands and uh and gravity being what it is um when beavers show up in that context and they start to build back the dams uh you sometimes have cities and subdivisions in the way um and a lot of what i do when i'm talking with like a city to planning department is just to point out simply like okay well be careful where it's flat 
because a lot of what we're seeing right now, um, you know, a family's been farming a piece of land in Oregon for uh, maybe five generations, and they've been farming right to the water's edge. Um, the water has been ditched into a, a stream, um, and then all this fertility is growing food and what have you. Um, and then when that sells to subdivisions, uh, like on, in the urban sprawl, we do this thing where we, where we say, well, now we're going to make the stream pristine. We're going to plant trees along it. And those are going to filter the runoff from all of our you know, impervious surfaces. And when we plant trees, that was the thing the beaver were missing. Mm. Well, that was good beaver habitat. And they were just missing the trees. The farmer the last was- last ingredient. Yeah. And so then they move in. And they bring that water back up to where they would expect it to be, and um, things get flooded. And so there's this cycle that's happening across the West now with urban expansion that's actually facilitating more beaver habitat in these in these systems that have been, you know, the the, the nerdy biology term, right? It's limiting factors. Uh, the, the the trees were limiting. Well, that's, so this is a uh, a beautiful story and a tragic story in many ways because um, isn't it marvelous at one level that you've got this creature that's literally responsible for making the bottom lands flat and rich and full of gold and all sorts of other things that we like, and we've made it very inhospitable to them by shooting at them and terraforming in our own ways and ripping out their dams and draining their wetlands and all these things, but some part of us still has a you know a vestige of that land is good because it's aesthetically nice right that's mm. a proxy <laughs> for good land right how would you know that you yeah. want to settle here well it might be that it looks very beautiful to you and that is actually an indicator and it has all the stuff you're probably going to want so you know we like it when the stream has some trees right that looks good to us and it looks good to the beaver and you put the trees there and holy moly you've just unleashed this animal that's responsible for all of the wealth that you're profiting from and your sense is oh my god that's terrible right yeah, like indeed. oh no those trees <laughs> right? well i'll hear i'll hear that even from folks who are restoration professionals and they they put in the trees and you know then i get the call like the beavers are in here cutting down my trees um and these are folks with some title like wildlife biologist or what have you. But the, the knee-jerk reaction sometimes can be like, trap out the beavers, you know. Right. Um, there's, there's a disconnect that these are, like if you do restoration and beavers show up, you met the beaver standard. Like congratulations, you just, right. your restoration project worked. It did. You know, you can hand it off to the professionals now. They're going to run with it. Right. And and you're right about, you know, this is why a good biological model is really what you want, because in some sense, it's not really surprising that you would sometimes be one ingredient short of perfect habitat for something like a beaver. Right. And if you don't think about it in those terms, right, you think, well, there are no beavers here. It's probably not good. And it's like, no, you're real close. Right. And if mm -hmm. you put that one thing there, boom, there's almost nothing you can do to stop this next Indeed. part of the process, which you might not like. Um, but it is, uh, well, let's just say it is an incredibly powerful force. That's really to the extent that some of us have been, and I, you know, even though I miss this aspect of them having transformed much of North America, um, I have been fascinated by this animal for a long time because the, um, the disproportionate capacity to affect the world around it, a small number of individuals being able to radically alter a habitat and turn it, for example, from, you know, a, a, a rushing stream into a small lake, right? That's an amazing capacity for an animal. And then, you know, if you told me there was such an animal, I wouldn't leap to the conclusion that it was going to be a rodent, uh -huh. right? Like right. a small number of individual rodents are going to build me a lake, right? That seems odd, right? This is not, um, it's not the clade that I would go to if I was looking for uh, an animal that, you know, I mean, how hard would it be if somebody assigned, you know, in your case, you've spent enough time with beavers that maybe you do a good job. But if you gave the average person the job of make me a lake here and you gave them a saw to chop down some trees and you said you can put the trees how you want and you can mud up the spaces in between you know most people would not be able to create a lake and yet this animal under it's not just that it chops down trees and 
uses them to block water flows and that that creates lakes. It's that it apparently each one of these valleys is its own puzzle and yeah. it solves that puzzle Indeed. right each time it figures out how to do it and and it does it collectively as a family which is also interesting so let's get into this let's let's just yeah. fill in the natural history okay, yeah. of beavers so that people understand uh what a remarkable and strange creature this is so I, we can start with family yep. right um they seem to mate for life um you've got a mom and a dad and not very sex sexually dimorphic. You can't really tell the difference. Um, some biologists have figured out a method. You turn the beaver upside down and you squeeze their butt and you sniff. And it either smells like diesel or cheese. <laughs> and Really? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, a true beaver biologist, yeah. if they know the diesel or cheese. Um, yeah. Uh, so you can't really tell mom or dad apart. Um, then they'll have like two to four young ones on average. Uh, a year and they the young ones stick around for a year or two so you've got teenagers helpers mm -hmm. right and so some colonies can be 12 individuals or more um, and they're territorial they've got a, a, an area of vegetation and water that they're managing actively and uh, and they manage it together I mean I guess that's what made me think about that as you're thinking about you know this animal intelligently building a, um, a dam it's 12 it, animals. It's even better no than one giving intelligently direction. building. It's intelligently collaborating mm -hmm. on a project in which everybody's got to do their part right. Yep. And there's no foreman. Right. And they do a lot of digging, too. So so beaver, they're very graceful in the water. Um, they're not graceful on land. And they're, they can be 60 pounds of slow-moving protein, right? I mean, anything they can would love to eat a beaver. Uh, so they flood landscapes to stay protected from predators. Uh, wolves were a big predator um, historically. Yep. Bears, big predator. In my yep. area, cougars are probably one of the, the main predator, um, aside from, of course, humans now. Right. Um, and in my area, the humans were, were a predator for a long time, too. Beavers were eaten. Um, so you've got this, this tight-knit family. They are interested in keeping the big kitties at bay by flooding the landscape, mm, right? Yep. And um, depending on the landscape, then they'll build a structure to live in. And if they flooded the landscape all the way to the sides of the valley, well, then, you know, they, they don't breathe underwater. They, they need a dry space. They'll build themselves up a lodge. And it's this freestanding mound of sticks and mud. And it has an underwater entrance, right? Kind of a front door. And sometimes it'll have mini... Uh, cavities in it sometimes they have kind of a mud room like dry your feet off and then come up to the main chamber i think i know which beaver thought of that yeah. <laughs> it's, the, it's the mother <laughs> yeah no there's yeah. no reason nope. to track all that mud into the rest of the lodge mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. uh, i've i've crawled up into one of these one time and they uh <laughs> They smell lovely, like like crushed willow. Um, Do they really? Yeah, yeah. The yeah, beavers kind of have a willowy scent. Um, yeah, it's not the rodent scent that triggers the human brain. Like, oh, this is something that yep. could give me a disease. That rat scent. Yeah, yeah. no, there's none that. of that. There's yeah. not even an undertone of that. It's, it's a crushed willow smell. Yeah, that's great. That's surprising to me. Yeah, um, but uh, but I get it. Okay, yeah. so they've got the big enough chamber for you to get in. Indeed. Yeah. And I'm, you're not tiny. No, I'm not tiny. You're, I'm crazy enough to crawl into a beaver lodge. Yeah, too. Um, apparently. Yeah, so so they have this this lovely little lodge and in in areas that um, freeze over winter, they'll pack a bunch of vegetation down in their pond um, as a larder to eat off of once the ice forms. So this is wood or woody mm -hmm. woody material. Yeah, yep. so and they the the, uh, the environment uh, softens it up over time or no you know there's there's discussion around like uh what it sitting in the water does right you know um the the main hypothesis for a long time has just been like accessibility when the ice forms got it right well that certainly makes a prediction that where the ice doesn't form they will do less or none of it yep and we see that kind of borne out you do yeah. okay cool yeah um they also they uh and kind of a knock-on effect of this collection of wood. So you think about a rodent that's obsessively taking vegetation from outside the stream, yep. adding it into the stream. So, so 
Um, just for the sake of filling this in for people who haven't spent much time in beaver habitat. Yeah. You've got beavers will put in a investment over what must be weeks on a very large log, right? I've seen that. Oh, I see. One big tree. One yeah. big tree, totally. which has to be on the shore mm -hmm. and has to be leaning in such a way that they can predict that it will fall into the water enough that they can then swim it to wherever they need it's a lot it easier if it falls in the water a lot easier if it falls mm -hmm. in the water it, there's presumably nothing they can do with a large tree if it falls out of the water mm -hmm. they will utilize it um no, so but they can't move it they can't move it yeah but you, they'll buck it up um mm, into really? lengths yes i've never seen that yeah that's cool yeah. Yeah. so how long a length will they buck is uh when you cut a um a log into rounds before you split it into pieces of yeah so firewood. if you're making firewood yeah um, 16 inches right yeah and it's funny because beaver and i don't know why seem to prefer a similar they, it looks like <laughs> cordwood except for the tapered at the end you know really and, bloop, 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 and you can you can spot a spot where a tree has been felled and bucked because there's the uh, wood chips at approximately oh, every 16 inches. Which you would totally, if you didn't know what was going on, probably assume implied human involvement. Mm, yeah, I, they, they do look a little like somebody was whacking at something with a hatchet. Right? Yeah. So beavers have these, these really impressive teeth. They grow continuously yep. for the beaver's life. Which is true of all rodents. Yeah, and the front of them are orange, um, which... I, I, uh, from what I understand, there's like a heavy iron component that keeps that front dentin um, hard. Yep. And so there's self sharpening. Yep. Uh, these these little uh, chisels, um, and it's it's impressive. They they can fell very big trees. Now, why they choose sometimes to fell big trees is interesting. You know, uh, beavers being territorial, they'll be managing a woodlot, if you will, a, a riparian area of trees and shrubs and the grasses and forbs uh, for, through their lineage through generations sometimes they'll pass up a tree for many 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 years and then one day it's like that's the tree so why do they do it well i don't have a good example of or uh, explanation for you know there's something more complicated going so on so what you're saying is you see a pattern mm -hmm. in which there is obviously some sort of i don't we, i'm not arguing that it's conscious we don't know how beaver's mind works yeah, but there's intentionality there's some choice to mm -hmm. now i fell that one and it could be that it is managing the habitat right in other words you liberate other trees that are struggling to get enough light for example by felling a big tree yep um, and that might be the reason that that one goes and so again this might be a management issue of parameters that make the habitat more productive of things that the beavers are eating or and there's a whole conversation with the plant too and the chemical defenses that plants put out to avoid browsers right yep. so every plant has their various phenolic compounds and whatever that they're spending some budget of energy on chemical yep. defense so we will uh this audience the dark horse audience will have heard heather uh, and me talk many times about secondary compounds. These are uh, compounds mm -hmm. that don't have a function inside the, the plant or the fungus or whatever that is producing them. Their purpose is to interact with uh, animals, usually to, um, to poison them so that they will move on and eat something else. Um, so anyway. And they taste bitter. Right. You know, well, animals have developed a taste yes. for this. <laughs> we have evolved the ability yes. to detect these things. Oh, that's a poison. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And in fact, um, you know, as you know, you've, you've been to the, the tropics um, and you know there's lots of things out there that are obviously fruits, but it's not obvious whether or not you can eat them. Right. Um, but there is a trick, which is, you know, you take a little fruit and you put mm -hmm. it on your tongue. And if it tastes bitter, you don't eat that thing. And uh, if it tastes good, then you can uh, gently explore it. Proceed and, with caution. Yes, this trick has never killed me. Yeah. Uh, not yet, at least. Not yet. Not yet. You being here. Is right. Like, that is like proof good evidence that so far it has worked. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, beavers do the same thing. Sometimes you'll see them nicking into a tree. You'll see like one little nick. And they didn't, they didn't choose to cut that tree. And then you'll really? see three or four nicks along. And then that, well, somebody's coming down. And, and an interesting thing, too, is it seems to be, you know, if you're a plant and you're low, you're expecting more browsers. And so you're going to spend more of your energy yep. producing these phenolic compounds, these bitter tannins to keep browsers at bay. But as you grow high, 
well, that, that doesn't make sense to spend all that budget anymore on chemical defense because you're above the height of the grazers and browsers. And so beavers kind of come in and um, subvert that by whacking the tree down. Yeah. And then they'll eat all the foli- foliage and the cambium layer from the massive tree that stops spending money or energy. On, energy on these, on um, these poisons. Yeah. And that is so like, interesting. And then you can watch the deer come in. Everybody loves it when a beaver drops a big tree because suddenly you have a very sweet uh, food source sitting there. Um, That's mind blowing. Actually, <laughs> no, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Why, why, why defend against the browsers if you're tall and they exactly. can't reach you? But the beaver has this other. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a little Those bit chisels. Yeah, it's reminiscent to me of the way a strangler fig reverses the tables on the other trees in a tropical forest mm-hmm. where, you know, in general, the problem for every tree in a tropical forest is you start out on the forest floor where there's almost no light, like 1% of the incident light actually makes it to the forest floor. And you've got to wait an awful long time before a gap opens up, right? right. And so most would-be trees just die of light starvation before they ever get a chance. And strangler figs uh, start, well, at least often at the top. They start, you know, a bat will uh, eat a fig and drop a seed in, you know, a crevice in a tree that's accumulated some dirt and the tree grows down from above where there's Mm -hmm. plenty of light. Mm -hmm. And now it has a water problem, weirdly. But Uh um, but anyway, this strikes me as that same sort of thing where um, the natural logic of the forest has been outthunk by one creature and there are all sorts of consequences um, for other creatures of, oh, well, suddenly that tree just came, you know, though vibrant and alive, just came crashing out of the canopy and you can browse it temporarily that's really cool yeah 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 and it it seems consistent with some of the observations i've made too where sometimes you'll walk a section and it it seems like there should be beaver here and you'll see sign that beavers have moved through but they haven't decided to settle you know there's plenty of water it seems like a good spot and i'm seeing lots of green things yeah but then you go look at the green things and consistently i see this in areas with like heavy elk brows or cat public land cattle grazing brows Mm -hmm. where you you look at the the typical plants beavers would be eating and they've been munched and munched and munched and munched and they've got this kind of like dwarfed bonsai look going and my mind immediately says well that's a very bitter plant right that is a plant that has responded with toxins and it's probably mm -hmm. not worth the beavers it's probably not worth so so to our human minds we're looking at Right. Lots of green stuff, but yeah, I feel like there's there's this underlying conversation between the plants and the the browsers. That oh, that's miss. that's really interesting, and it does. There is one observation in a completely different system um, that I wonder if it might not be related. Cool. So back when I used to study tent making bats, um, by far, by far, like by ten or twenty times, you would find empty tents um you know and one in 20 times you might find a bat in the tent or a family of bats um but then also in addition to all of the empty tents and the empty tents have a relatively straightforward answer uh, explanation which is that the bats are moving on to where you know, this was the hypothesis i tested while i was doing my dissertation work was that these bats all of the tent making bats are small and they pay a high price for locomotion the bigger Mm. bat you are the more efficient a flyer you are and so Uh flying long distances is is expensive for these animals and so they are placing tents near the fruiting trees Mm -hmm. um but you know a tree might be in fruit for a week or two and then it's not in fruit and having a tent there isn't all that useful so it moves on so there's lots of empty tents because they're always in motion but there's also this other phenomenon of partially built tents that never get completed Mm. And, you know, presumably sometimes that's the result of the animal having started something and then being consumed by a predator. Sure. Right. But there are too many of them for it to be that. And I wonder if there aren't, you know, I I wondered if some of it might be practice, you know, the building a tent that they build them in. uh, Well, when I was working on Barrow, Colorado Island, I was there for 18 months and there was literally only two species of understory plant with a large enough leaf to make a tent that I never saw a tent made in. Um, 
And so they're making them in broadly hundreds yeah. of different species of plants, which have different leaf shapes. And so, right, and they're chewing into the little vine, right, and they're collapsing the structure of the leaf. Is they're that mostly I... using the um, the claws at the tips of their thumbs, and they're using their flight muscles, which are their strongest muscles, to tear the leaf. Nobody knew this huh. because nobody had seen a bat make a tent. I did manage to see it and actually videotape it, um, and it's the pulling with the thumbs and the claws, and that... it's one leaf. That that's been kind of collapsed onto itself, right? Well, there are a bunch of different structures. Oh, okay. That's one of them. That's uh -huh. that's, uh, that's the one, one of seen. the more common yeah. ones. But there are a bunch of different structures, including one really cool structure in which they cut a bunch of different leaflets on the same whorl and cause a kind of a cylinder. Mm. Um, but anyway, it, it, it's a, there's a lot of partially completed tents, and I you know I have wondered about whether it's practice. Yeah. Right, learning to build a tent in some leaf that you've never built one in before. Um, but it is also possible that there is something about toxins, right? Now, uh, it's unclear that they do very much uh, with their mouths, so maybe they're not being toxified that way. But it's, it is possible that the plant is releasing something, you know, when they uh, tear into it and that is, that is noxious or something. So anyway. Totally. Yeah, I think, I think that's a spot that we often don't think to look. Right. Yes. And... The plant would only be doing that if they have an interest in no bats sleeping here tonight, right? That is a, well, certainly the process of tent building is destructive of the plants. It's wasteful. It's parasitic from the mm -hmm. plant's perspective. Mm -hmm. okay. um, yeah. I, the uh, guano that's accumulated isn't a, a trade-off? Probably there's some benefit, but mm -hmm. I can't imagine it's worth the expense of losing these large leaves. I mean, for one thing, these large leaves, you know, I know because I watched leaves get modified and then, you know, I watched what happened to them afterwards. So I was sort uh -huh. of aware of individual leaves. These leaves are, you know, investments that last for years, uh -huh. right? And so that's a big loss in the case of a, a small understory plant with a big leaf. So. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but we digress. We are so far <laughs> away from, from beavers here. Um, no beavers in Central or South America. No. I no. mean, there are some other interesting things. Uh, but They got moved down there, and it's a bit of a problem. Is that true? Yeah. I yeah. have not seen them. Oh, yeah. The, the Patagonia beavers. Oh, I guess that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yep. Far enough. That's south. a landscape that did not co-evolve with logging. And rodents. so what has happened? Well, so you see the... The plants drown and die, and there's these large deserts of water and vegetation death. Wow. Which is completely the reverse of what you see in the entire northern hemisphere, Europe and North America, where you just see this explosion of life. Like everything's like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> That's so fascinating. Yeah. And and it's it's a it's a beautiful demonstration of two things that Heather and I talk a lot about on Dark Horse. One is welcome to complex systems, mm -hmm. right? Just because the, this animal is a, uh, a source of bounty in one habitat doesn't mean that it's a source of bounty inherently, right? right. It can be a destructive force yeah. elsewhere, which is really uh, um, interesting. Uh, and it's also a question of hyper novelty here where, you know, a beaver from North America isn't going to find its way to Patagonia absent human help, right? But uh, once you provide that help, I would imagine it's a pretty difficult creature to remove. We've been helpful that way with a lot of animals. And yes, beaver, yeah. their fur being as luxurious as it was, we, we thought it was a good idea. I wanted to ask you about that. I do want yeah. to finish out the natural history story. But um, mm -hmm. in general, when a creature has a particularly cool pelt, there's a reason, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So in the case of otters, which I see otters, which have the densest fur of any mammal, I believe, um, it's a wetsuit, yeah. right? And the point is you've got a small animal who is in cold water and would radiate away all of its heat. It wouldn't be possible to have that otter if it wasn't effectively not in the water because it's wearing a wetsuit that is so dense that it is actually keeping the skin from contacting the water. All right, so what's going on with beavers? Same, Same? exact thing that you laid out. And in fact, that's why their pelts were worth so much. It wasn't uh, worth a lot on the leather, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> these pelts were being shaved and then that that underfur, that densely packed oh. underfur, was being felted, and that's a Lincoln hat, you know, the tall yeah. stovepipe hat. Those things held 
moisture at bay and heat in because it was the felted under fur of beavers. And so felted, I never understood yeah, that. I, yeah. The mat is a hatter thing is yeah. because they were using mercury. Uh, mercury. In yeah. That. Yep. So it's, it's felted. Well, I knew about the mercury. I did not know that that was a uh, beaver felt. Indeed. Yeah. So that, that whole period where it was fashionable to wear a black hat uh, of a certain shape and really silk, the, the, the influx of silk from Asia saved the remnants of the beaver population in this continent uh, because then fashion fickly turned to silk and, uh, and there were some, some refugees left on the landscape. Jeez, there seems to be no end to the number of things I didn't know about these animals. <laughs> um, that, is, that is amazing. I assumed that the pelts were being used in the I mean, classic. people make coats and stuff too with the fur, but right. the, the real use, and, and still today, uh, the best Western hats you can buy are, you know how, I don't know how much you've worn a cowboy hat, but there's an X system, like it's a 1X hat, a 2X hat, you know, you have a 10X hat. And the X's got weird. Now they're saying it's 100 X. It doesn't matter. That's grading on how much beaver fur there is versus rabbit and some other animals. Really? Yeah. It's a it's a percentage of, you know, you're you're really balling if you got a 100% beaver fur because that was very expensive to manufacture. But it also means it's the best hat. Um, Interesting. You know, whereas a 10 X, you know. You're working up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have a hat that people take to be a cowboy hat, and they give me a lot of crap over it. It's a leather hat, which is freaking marvelous mm. for the field because it, uh, you know, it can be pouring, and the thing just keeps the rain away from you, and you can, you know, it needs a little work, and you can put avocado oil on it or whatever. It's a <laughs> great hat, but it ain't it ain't uh, beaver felt or anything yeah. related to it. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's let's go back to the natural history of these animals. So they build a lodge, pair mm -hmm. mates for life. Uh, yeah, I didn't finish out the lodge story. Yeah. So so in a context where they've been successful and they've laterally, you know, across a valley, wetted the system. And they've got this spongy wetland of habitat yeah. that's growing all this stuff that they're eating. And um, then they have to build a lodge. But if they're in a system where there's a high bank convenient to deep water, then they can just build a tunnel up into that bank and mm -hmm. it saves a lot of effort. And so a lot of times you'll also see beavers denning in banks where yep. they can create that air pocket. Usually they'll choose to den under the root structure of some big deciduous tree mm -hmm. uh, to help avoid predators digging in on them, right? That provides like this uh, lattice work of wood, wood bulwarks against digging predators also sort of strikes me as uh, reminiscent of the shoring up of mine shafts. Uh, it, yeah, totally. It looks that way. You yeah. know, you've got this, this, these arching timbers over a hollowed out space. I don't know what the tree thinks about having all that activity under it, but uh, they often, they'll often choose to go do that. And we see more of that in the context of today's landscape, because of course, um, many of our creeks have collapsed into these systems where you like look down at the creek from yeah. up on the flat. Which is just an unnatural thing. Not normal, huh? Yeah, not in the northern hemisphere. Interesting. So, yeah. um, what would it look like? Well, so you read some of the the old trapper journals, right? Like, how do we peer back into the misty past? At okay, well, our baseline for what this is, is skewed. What you can't go to Grinnell's journals, the, the, the naturalist who came through and um, kind of recorded what he was seeing because. That was post beaver trapping, mm. you know. So you've got a little bit on on trapping journals and and some of the maps that were being produced, and you know, just some of the accounts where you'll hear about a, a party that would come into come off of a ridge top and they get to a valley and they'd spend a day or two trying to find a spot to cross the cross the valley because it's just one epic spongy. beaver wetland. Yeah, yeah, it's just a spongy, wild world, and they would find usually a beaver dam to cross. And these beaver dams had persisted on the landscape so long that you could actually walk horses and wagons across these things. These things were wide wow. and so have, deeply rooted. Do you have, Mel, obviously you're telling me it's a little hard to figure it out uh, mm -hmm. because the evidence wasn't well preserved, but any idea how long uh, a history, a beaver dam that you could take horses and... and uh, yeah, right. Like... How, how, how old is, how old is that? that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that gets into kind of, um, do these things get passed down? We know they get passed down, right? We've got these families that are tending these things. Um, but it's, it's not as simple as, uh, 
you know, you've got your natal family and they defend it against all others. Yeah. Um, there's many accounts of actually beaver families taking in refugees. Um, even some of the early accounts from 150 years ago, uh, there's uh, this one author, Enos Mills, describes this account where a uh, wildfire came through an area and um, one of the places beavers were living was very pitchy and the, the trees were close and it cracked all their lodges open and it destroyed the habitat. And there's a number of like 30 beavers living in this spot. And then a few miles away, down a drainage and up another drainage, there's another habitat where beavers are living, but they've, they've successfully created that sponge that buffered them from the fire completely. The fire got down to the water, it didn't burn, it moved on, and they had a, um, a spot there that was working. And he tracked the beavers whose habitat had been completely destroyed as they went down the stream looking for a new spot, but then turned right and went up and over the hill at exactly the point where it was the shortest distance to the, um, the habitat that was across the ridge, and then down and uh, joined the beavers and the pond that had survived. And so you, and, and there was no sign of conflict. Like it, it right. It, so so we don't know, you know, how these things are passed. We know that there's these familial ties. Right. Um, we know there's these these territories, and these. Um, I don't know how long a be. I mean. These things grow roots too, because you think about willow, right? Yeah. Beavers are clipping it into little segments and they're jamming it into these these dams that are built of mud and willow sticks, and then those willow sticks root. Yeah. The willows have gotten yeah, wise can, to the you fact. Can, you can uh, plant a willow from a cutting, and exactly. so they're effectively doing that. Yeah, and so and a, a dam that's only even three years old will be starting to literally root into the ran landscape. Um, so let me ask you. So I, there are so many things I want to ask you. Um, Obviously, nobody knows in that case of these beavers who were taken in as refugees. Mm -hmm. My prediction, based on what I think I know about biology, will be that they were closely related. Um, sure. But it's also possible that reciprocal altruism could do it, where um, the beavers that had that piece of habitat that had functioned um, uh, could, you know, if they were limited in their reproductive rate, and they could have used the labor of more beavers than they had. It's possible. It's a little hard to imagine that because you would think that beavers could produce enough uh, baby beavers mm -hmm. to right. to fill up that um, that valley. But in any case, something interesting has to be. Going there's on There's interesting there. stuff that we don't understand. There's there's a lot of accounts of um, digging a canal to move water into a different system to then build a dam and flood to access it. Like say you've got a really great all, uh, stand of Aspen over here, Yeah. right? But the stream is intermittent. There's not enough to dam to get to the Aspen. There's many accounts of beavers. They, they dig canals across the landscape and they'll divert water into a, an adjacent system, then utilize that water by building a dam and then log out the Aspen Grove. And again, they're doing this with no foreman. It's like a flume. Right. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, a canal. Yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, that's beautiful. And, um, you know, as you probably remember from class back in 2010 or whatever, um, one of the things I'm interested in is uh, ways that evolution solves longer term problems than you would think it could right. based on lineage selection and explorer modes. And so anyway, this strikes me as a, as a good a good case that one might go pursue those things and, and discover that, um, you know, what has to be true for the reward of, you know, investing in a canal to a habitat that isn't wet enough, you know, pays off. Well, that can very easily be true if you're dealing with a lineage level Indeed. Um, phenomenon for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, to your point about age of Beaver Dam too, um, there's this, this stream called Spawn Creek outside Logan, Utah. And uh, when you go walk up it, there's there's a number of beaver dams, and it's a very high gradient creek. So they'll build a 12 foot tall beaver dam, and it doesn't buy them a lot of pond before they need to build another beaver dam, right? Because right? the the stream is steep enough that, whereas in like in a low gradient valley, you yep. can build a two foot beaver dam and get, get acreage, it. right? Right. So you walk up this stream, and then you'll notice that there's these stair steps of calcium um, in the stream as well. And they're, they're these funny things. They're like these benches of calcium. Um, 
hypothesis being those are more or less fossilized beaver dams mm. that the calcium carbonate precipitated out yep. over a very long period of time. And Aspen being what they are, that that being <laughs> has been there for a very long time. And so beavers have been there for a very long yeah, time too. This makes some, I've, I've wondered about this looking at uh, beaver ponds for so long, how they, it's like they are a standing wave, mm, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have to start thinking in terms of an equilibrium and you have to start thinking about, uh, you know, I mean, um, Dawkins, of course, uses beavers uh, to elucidate his concept of, uh, ex of uh, extended phenotype, which I think is actually, it's a great concept. Yeah. Um, and beavers really are a tremendous exemplar of this where, you know, if you're just looking at the animal, you're really not looking at the animal because the animal is all of the consequences of the animal yep. that make the animal possible, right? Including making its own little lakes, right? That's um, an amazing thing. But if you then project it through time and the point is, well, you know, a lake once made is valuable at lineage level and a lake once made is a way of bootstrapping your way to some location that was too far to be useful, right? The, the possibilities that are opened by an animal that can terraform and can do so over centuries or potentially millennia is, it's a very powerful force, um, much more so than, you know, the road from which it's built. Indeed, yeah. And some of us use the term beaver as a verb sometimes. Like, mm. That system has been beavered. Has been beavered, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Makes sense. I mean, to kind of Dawkins' portrayal of it, the animal is bigger than the furry thing you're seeing. Yep. Um, a system that is beavered, that, that brings a lot of explanation as to how that complex system is working. Um, right, and we have in some sense anti-beavered these systems now, right? You have... Unambiguously anti-beavered. <laughs> but not just by removing the beavers. Mm -hmm. We have in fact done... So on the one hand, you've got who knows... Presumably, it's millions of years that beavers have been modifying right. these landscapes. Yeah. At least since the last ice age. Right. But, but the beavers didn't evolve since nope. the last ice age. Nope. So the point is there's some ebb and flow. And most of the um, uh, glaciation was, you know, up around the American-Canadian border. So it's right. not like North America was completely inaccessible to these animals mm -hmm. at, at all, even, even during glaciation. So we're talking about millions of years of um, these creatures modifying habitats and uh, sediments accumulating with their gold and their nutrients and all of these things. And then, um, of course, you know, you have a couple of influxes of people. You have the discovering of America from the east. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, from the west first, right? Um, from what we call the East, right? Asians who have come through Beringia, Beringia. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, developed into so many different cultures in the Americas. And then you have the second influx of Europeans who rediscover America and um, intensively exploit it in a mm -hmm. way that not only do they trap out the beavers for hats and the like, um, but we have now taken to intensively uh, extracting resources. The, the technological revolution has allowed us to produce, you know, with the Haber-Bosch process, we can fertilize crops and they grow ferociously. We can irrigate them. We can exterminate their pests. But the point is, um, you forgot about equilibrium. Right. Right. There were some things that you're depending <laughs> on and you're now spending them down. Mm -hmm. And topsoil is absolutely one of these things. Right. Yep. We are in a topsoil crisis and we are increasingly close to effectively growing our food hydroponically in dead soils that we then pump nutrients that are the product of an industrial process rather than a biological process. Right. And, you know, in some sense, that's what happens when you view the beavers as uh, a phenomenon limited to that little or not so little bundle of brown fur rather than as a landscape altering equilibrium maintaining force of nature which is well we can were. even say weather changing oh, please please tell us about the weather changing well so you know the uh the hydrologic cycle that you know you learn when you're a kid and it's then you relearn it and you relearn it. It's like kind of one of this, like the salmon cycle where people like to put it on a graph. But basically, uh, you know, 
Water evaporates in the ocean, forms clouds, comes over land, rains, moves it back out on stream. Yep. Right? That's a pump. Yep. And what drives that pump? Well, one of the things that's most important in driving that pump is vegetative transpiration. Mm. Right? Oh, so you've yeah, got yeah. you've got trees and they do it most where it's a wetland yep. breathing this moist air up and that's that's a uh, or a lack of pressure rather that draws in the clouds off the ocean. Yeah. Um, and there's there's some wonderful work on this. This guy Professor Mian Mian has been working in Spain around this. Um, I think it sometimes is called the term biotic pump. Mm -hmm. um, but you've got a cycle where you've got the land pulling the moisture up out of the out of the sea. Uh, and it's really the it's it's how much moisture you're putting up there that creates that pressure or lack of pressure that draws in the clouds. And so beaver wetlands, that's that's where you get most of your vegetative transpiration. So and you take that out. Yeah, you've got less and you put them in a parking lot, you've got even less. And you can imagine these rain pathways yep. that have been thousands of years of rain pathways. And there's a certain thing that maintain that pump. And then we make land use decisions and we start doing things like turning these wetlands that were facilitating that pump into crop lands where we're keeping things on life support. Yeah. And more or less it's functioning as a desert as far as what it's giving back to the air most of the year. And you can see how we're going to start break, seeing the breakdown. And we've seen the breakdown in rain patterns. And, you know, you can even look at, in mythology in Iran. Um, one of the, uh, the rules was you never kill a water dog. They called the beavers the water dogs mm -hmm. because a drought will follow. Mm. You know, back to your, like, useful mythologies, yeah. right? They had, they had laws on the book, like you killed a, a water dog. And there was severe penalties. You had to pay a, a restitution. Um, yeah. And... Similar thing within the indigenous communities of North America, the, the trappers that came in had a really hard time persuading any of the tribes that were in drought prone areas to trap beaver. Mm. They got the, the forest tribes to sign on board much sooner than any of the tribes that were sensitive. And, and, and most of those folk had stories that maintained a um, uh, <laughs> rule against over harvesting beaver because then you then you lose the system that's me i mean i hunt i people who hunt will tell you the productivity is there at beaver wetlands like that's where the fish are that's where the game is like you're hungry yeah go to a beaver wetland yeah right and so this this ecological wealth um is not only the beaver it's not only the landscape um but it's also driving these these patterns that uh, we're even more reliant on. Yeah, so it, it, it's interesting. If you think about, you know, the, the, the thing that we teach about uh, effectively evaporation, um, creating humidity, the cloud gets to the mountain, it rises, it cools, the water falls out, it runs back mm -hmm. down, eventually ends in, in the sea. All true. Um, but what you're saying is, how quickly it returns to the sea has a lot to do with whether or not there are beavers in between because the beavers effectively for their own benefit detain the water they detain the water in a way that not only does it sit there in these artificial ponds and lakes but um, it incentivizes the growth of plants that are useful to the beaver which then take that water and spread it out vertically so it's not like a big a bundle of water with a small surface area but it's effectively has a huge surface area yes right and then the sun vertically down too because gravity being what it is you block up water that's trying to move downhill and you're going to start recharging your ground table right water. recharging the groundwater which mm -hmm. is so, so vital to so many out. of these processes um i'm tempted i won't detain us but um you know as you also may remember from class um I used to joke about the fact that my bicycle was gravity fusion fusion power. I powered. do remember, do you that, remember that. Yes. And the basic <laughs> punchline of that whole story is that all of this stuff, almost no matter what, including things like um, uh, like nuclear fission, are solar powered, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
they may not have been powered by our sun, but they were powered by a star. And the basic point is you could tell that whole story and you could look at all of the different places where energy from uh, this, you know, gravity fusion reactor in the sky is pumping this water around in these waves that establish equilibria that will allow you to return to that wetland and hunt there for uh, effectively eternity, right? Or to farm there uh, if you are careful to allow something to restore those equilibria. And then if you just ignore those things and you say, well, you know, how high can we drive the rate of productivity up? And the answer is pretty damn high temporarily, right? Right. Well, and if we're talking about residence time in that cycle, another component of that is if you don't have the draw, then you still have uh, water vapor hanging out over the ocean, but it just can't go anywhere, right? Right. That's a that's a powerful greenhouse effect. Mm, uh, right. Professor Mian Mian uses the number forty times more powerful than CO two. Yeah. You know, I don't know, but you've got suddenly a a lens of vapor that doesn't have anywhere to go. It can't go condensate and rain. Right. And so it's stuck there. It's not like we are running out of water. Our planet has just as much water. Right. Right. But our land is running out of water. Yeah, that's interesting. That's really interesting. And actually, um, you pointed something out. I'm a little embarrassed that I didn't know this also. Right. So I've been uh, since I was You're a rather intimidating figure to bring anything in this realm to. And so I'm kind of pleased. No, no, I've... it's it's good. I, I'm always delighted by people who know stuff deeply enough to just deliver important facts that you've somehow been overlooking. Yeah. Um, I, I picked up the habit from my uh, grandfather, who was um, my earliest scientific mentor of you know, being glued to the window of the aircraft when you fly anywhere oh, yeah. because there's so much to see, right? It's troubling for us with long legs because we both want the aisle and the window seat. And Yeah, I yeah. have not been in that predicament. But uh, I, it's I, real. <laughs> it's, it's, it's it sounds tragic, frankly. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I would just uh, you know take the window and uh, that's what I do. deal with the social yep. cost of stepping Numbness over the and tingling for oh, the next twelve hours. Well, there you but go. you know you had the window <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but anyway, um, so you know what has been out the window has changed in my lifetime a lot, along mm -hmm. with a bunch of other things. Um, one of the things that has proliferated uh, to insane proportions are these circular uh, fields. Yeah. Um, yeah. Pivots. Pivots, you call them. Yep. Can you describe what a pivot is? So a pivot is where you have a well and a spot where potentially you can grow something. And uh, where the water then comes out, it pivots <laughs> into a long pipe that swing, swings on a, uh, uh, around the axis. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you get more or less a wheel as this pipe swings around and there's sprinklers attached to the whole thing. Yeah, so you've got uh, an irrigation, an elevated irrigation Array. tube yeah. uh, on wheels yep. that is moving around a circular. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically the, the idea is it's kind of an automated self-irrigating. Totally. You can control them with smartphones. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Cool. I guess that would make sense, you know. Right. But you mix fertilizer in, and it just distributes it at whatever proportion. You it. know, it's this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the thing that I didn't know, I mean, I knew that those were crops, and I knew that they were irrigated. I didn't realize. I should have realized because obviously that's an irrigation. That circle is an irrigation um, scar, effectively. Um, mm -hmm. But that every one of those is a well suggests something. Um, profound about the level to which this activity is, you know, unless somebody has paid direct attention to the equilibrium that the aquifer that they are tapped into is being recharged at the same rate it is being depleted, you know, or better, then that is a short-term process. It's a short-term process. Yeah. And short term process and at the same time what you've got is all of this habitat that was by definition involved in some sort of ecological equilibrium with respect to nutrients right you are now extracting you are taking off that land whatever it is that is being grown there and so you know no kidding that we have a topsoil crisis and a aquifer depletion crisis and the problem uh is in the style of thinking that doesn't 
look backward enough to understand, oh, all of that wealth was loaded into these places by mm -hmm. processes like beavers that you then turned into hats, right? And you are now uh, not only interrupting the process that would cause the rain to fall at a rate that would keep your equilibrium where it was, but you're depleting the stored water beneath, right? And the, We're withdrawing and we're not making deposits. Right. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. It, we're on a we're on a spending spree that we haven't mm -hmm. noticed and and right. you know part of what you're telling me is that what we are spending is downstream of a process called beavering right, right. Yeah. and to the extent that that is known i don't think it's well understood by most people who are looking out the window of the plane or making decisions about um, farming and productivity or food security or whatever they're thinking about i i think this just is not it hasn't reached the public well so that gets to the a decision being made as an individual versus something that's in the interest of the public at large right mm. if you're if you're a farmer and you're irrigating crops and you're feeding people, but yeah, the water's coming out of somewhere that I don't fully understand and it's getting lower every year. Um, do you take a hit and stop farming because, you know, that you, you acknowledge that that is a, not a long term solution? Or do you keep farming and hope that something else happens in the broader world? I mean, I think that's where we get into kind of, I forget what you called it. You had something you'd talk about in class, uh, the moral uh, paradox uh, uh, or something. There's tragedy of the commons, collective action problems. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of ways to describe it. But what you're getting at is that we have a collective interest in not um, liquidating the well-being introduced to the landscape by beavers. We have a collective interest and a lineage level interest, right? Right. Our descendants five generations from now depend on the fact that we will not have ignored the equilibrium factor and just depleted it the highest rate possible and then assumed that some process would magically rescue us at the end of that. Yep. Right? Those processes sometimes do rescue us and sometimes they don't and we can't afford the ones that don't. Um, but but anyway, the, the point is, and this is one of these really important places where there is a discussion that absolutely has to take place mm -hmm. between um, what I would call hard-headed progressives, and I don't want to presume to define you, but I believe you are a hard-headed progressive, as am I, and so-called conservatives. Mm -hmm. And what I hope will happen is that the conservatives, of whom there are many who are frankly struggling to preserve the gains that 10 years ago we all agreed were good right struggling to preserve you know a fair colorblind society um, in which everyone has access to the market and you know a means to get ahead in which you know merit produces rewards conservatives who are doing that job are I now find them strangely deaf to the idea that being a conservative also naturally requires us to preserve the substrate on which we all live, right? That the society that does, you know, reward hard work and insight and doesn't give a damn what color your skin is or what your sexual orientation is or any of those other parameters. That society only works if the underlying stuff continues to exist for us to, to utilize. And in some sense, what I'm getting at is I believe that sustainability is a natural concept that conservatives should embrace but because of uh, the dialogue about ecology having focused so heavily on global warming and because there are clearly things wrong with the portrayal of global warming I don't know I assume you're not a dark horse uh, listener but you know Heather and I have navigated this a bunch of times right we are, believe that global warming is real, but we also believe that we are being given a story that's far too um, black and white to be realistic. That in, in Does it does have a high PR budget. 
Yeah, it has a very high sure. PR budget. And my conservative neighbors would point out gives them a certain amount of skepticism. It is a very good reason for skepticism. Yeah. And the fact that we know from inside the academy that any time people are in a panic over some process that is threatening them, the chances that the literature represents an accurate exploration of the factors that go in one direction or the other is effectively zero, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. you know, I think the point is the models, A, models are not the same thing as empirical results and we are treating those models as empirical results um, and those models models are always suspect because you can if you are willing to put enough parameters into a model you can get it to match any behavior you want it doesn't mean that you've identified something real right it becomes just a self-fulfilling uh, generator of academic papers but so if we put aside that we know that there's something wrong with the discussion about global warming and that that's dangerous and tragic because we do need to know what the truth of it is, right? Um, but just put aside global warming. The point is that we've got an environmental crisis that has nothing to do with global warming. If global warming were a complete fiction, we would still be in a very dangerous mm -hmm. circumstance because of collective action questions in game theory, um, because of failure to recognize equilibria. And, you know, those things require good governance to solve them. And this is, you know, this is the bitter pill, I think, for uh, libertarianism, right? I have some sympathy with libertarians because I believe they have identified the central value that we should be maximizing, right? Realized liberty is a great value to maximize precisely because it forces you to solve every other issue, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, you can't be free if you are in danger of being wiped out by a medical crisis in your family, right? So if we really tried to maximize how much liberty individuals could, act, could, uh, could actually exercise, then we would have to solve all of these problems. And good governance is required. Of course, at the moment, I don't think anybody who's looking at what our governments are doing can be all that enthusiastic about empowering them, right? So anyway, I've again led us far afield, but... Um, well, I think there's an interesting thing here in that um, if we focus on carbon, it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around, especially when it's in the air. It's invisible. Yep. You know, non-toxic, no. can't see it, doesn't smell. Maybe, uh, maybe something technological will save us. Yep. Right. But until then, there's not much anybody can do, uh, with the typical toolkit. Yep. Whereas if you're thinking about the water cycle and you're thinking about this complex system, there's a lot that each individual human can do um, to facilitate a shift. I mean, it's, it becomes a land use conversation, right? And, um, you know, it's interesting. What, I have a lot of friends who are, are very conservative and they, uh, they have a, um, a deeper relation to the land if I'm going to paint with a broad brush than a lot of my friends who are much more progressive, mm -hmm. right? Um, in fact, usually the folks who know the most about beaver are the beaver trappers that mm. are being demonized then by the folks who are trying to save the beaver, right? And yet these, uh, these folks know more about beavers than a lot of the folks who are raising money for beaver projects, right? Um, but I wonder if there's something with the baseline. You know, the baseline that conservatives are, are feeling protective of um, doesn't extend far enough back to prior to when we started the extractive process that is, um, you know, not going to go too long in the future. Like, like there's something that's invisible back there when beavers were in charge of water for all of North America. And, and we, the conservation tendency, the conservative tendency to like, hey, let's stabilize this system where it's at and just change when we see it necessary. Um, I don't think it's, 
it sees that. I mean, this was yep. the case when we came in and uh, made national parks, right? The, the, the Yosemite is the perfect example where there's these huge, beautiful meadows and these, you know, towering trees. And, and there was the conservatives at the time were like, there's just this one problem. There's these people who live here. Right. <laughs> you know, and I, I encountered this with some of the work I did with you and Heather when we were in Panama too, like this tendency to be like, well, let's just get the people out. And then this beautiful thing will be retained. Right. The Awanichi. Yeah. The Indians who were, yeah. were yeah. in that beautiful and then valley. Now what does that valley look like? Well, is it fully encroached in brush? You know, mm -hmm. all those flowers that were the first foods that people were maintaining are diminished and you realize that was another ecosystem engineer that we took off the landscape. People were in charge of, just as beavers have been methodically managing the waterways, right? Yep. People were methodically managing the uplands with fire. So, and so we see these collapses, right? But, but the conservation tendency was blind to the process, blind to the people who are maintaining a productive system with fire or that beavers were maintaining a productive system with water. So I don't know, I, I agree with your diagnosis. There's a, you know, there's a willingness to look back a certain distance, but not far enough to really understand that, you know, you have stepped into a new realm and you're, you're failing to, you know, whether you're a conservative or a progressive or whatever you are, you're failing to preserve this thing of value. Mm -hmm. And, my sense is that people are basically alike in that they appreciate um, beautiful places. They appreciate uh, things that don't require intensive work to maintain, right? Give people the opportunity and everybody looks, you know, at a gorgeous landscape and has a positive feeling about it, right? right. Um, what, what, I don't what I don't know what to do about is... We start doing something at a small scale, inherently. That's how everything starts. And when you are at that small scale, the fact that that process, if you were to extrapolate up to some you know, immense inflation of that same process, then becomes a threat to your very ability to persist. At what point does it make sense to have that conversation? Right? Does mm -hmm. it make sense to have that conversation when you're experimenting, you know, on the workbench in your garage with that little process that if it really caught on a hundred years later would be an issue? No, right? You should be allowed to experiment. But the there is no way that functioning at the scale that we are at, that the right answer to the question doesn't involve, okay, in what way? Can we rationally rein ourselves in mm -hmm. without triggering any of the failure modes, right? Well, if we rein ourselves in and our competitors don't rein themselves in, the place gets destroyed anyway, and we will also have lost out and they will be more powerful than we. Classic tragedy of the commons. Yep. That's a problem you have to solve, right? You you cannot do this as a matter of personal responsibility. You cannot do this with your nation behaving responsibly and others not behaving responsibly. It has to be done as a matter of some kind of good governance. And mm -hmm. I don't know how you would do it at the moment. I'm absolutely terrified of governments having more power because I think they're all malignant. I don't know of a government that I trust at the moment. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I also don't want to die of that concern because it means, well, we're not going to manage any of the things that have to be managed in order for us to persist. So doesn't that seem like a, a natural place where conservatives and progressives ought to be talking at this moment about how can we keep doing, you know, how can we continue to have the goose that lays the golden eggs without destroying the world on which it lives? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and what I found doing the work that I do is it, it is uniting for folks. Like as long as it can not become a fuzzy animal that needs saved issue, mm. if we can stick to beaver or a process. This is an intelligent, complex thing that yep. we need to defer to. We need to put the professionals back in charge of our water because what we've been doing with the water doesn't seem to be working very well, right? right. Um, that's something that I've found consistently everyone can get on board with. But then you start saying, well, on your land, 
you now have to make a concession. You have to take those three acres out of productivity and yep. allow beavers to return it to wetland. And that's where things get edgy because people are making livelihoods off this land, right? And it's like, why would I t incur the cost to society? Society values a system that's working better and society values beaver, but then I, am, as a landowner, are going to incur the cost of that. You know, what's in it for me? Right. Now, actually, um, this raises... I don't want to pretend to know more about it than I do, but there was an episode in uh, in Ecuador mm -hmm. where Ecuador, under President Correa, made a point that I thought was exactly accurate. So Ecuador has the world's most diverse habitat in it, in Yasuni, in the Amazon. And there is oil in Yasuni. And Correa basically said to the international community, this is a treasure. It should not be destroyed over the temporary extraction of oil. But that is not the responsibility of the Ecuadorian people. This is a treasure of planet Earth. And what we need is the resources so that the people of Ecuador are not punished for preserving <laughs> this global treasure, and then we will not extract the oil. And the world stared him down and said no. Mm -hmm. And my sense is, game theoretically, he was perfectly right. This is exactly the problem with all of these things, right? Just because Yosemite happens to be in your backyard doesn't give you the right to destroy it, yeah. right? Same with Yasuni, same with any of these things. Do we have the right, if we want, to screw up all of the aquifers in North America, to let all of the topsoil wash into the sea, you know, to, you know, use fossil fuels to inject the systems with, you know, non-biotic nitrogen? Not really, right? Why does any generation get the right to screw up the planet and leave a lesser place for future generations. That just seems to me that we have a moral obligation. It, we're never going to be perfect at it. We're always going to destroy some stuff we don't mean to. But in principle, no generation has the right to leave a lesser planet to future generations. And, you know, the idea that, well, we'll think of something. Sometimes you do. Mm -hmm. But, then you know, extinction is a one-way process, right? We are going to lose creatures that will not... You know, future generation. You know, it's like uh, the the Tasmanian wolf. It's gone. Right? It's gone. It's one example, but yeah. Um, but that was something that was part of the richness of Earth, and it's no longer. And yeah. um, in any case, I do hope that uh, that conservatives will begin to recognize. You know, I, I sometimes hear, and it frightens me, that modern conservatives. You know, I I, I say this provocative thing, which I. I, I mostly believe. Do you say provocative things sometimes? Sometimes. <laughs> I say uh, conservatives defend the gains of past liberals, uh -huh. right? Um, which is mostly true. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's entirely true if we think broadly enough about it. But anyway, it's somewhere in the ballpark. Uh, and the what comes back lately is, you know, progressives have done their job. It's over. Right. This is now the time for us to conserve what has been achieved. Mm -hmm. And it's not like I don't know what they're talking about. I do. On the other hand, it's not achieved because you can't continue to do what we're doing indefinitely, which means that, you know, you've got a system which is going to destroy itself for all of its failure to pay heed to those equilibria. And it is going to inherently leave a more boring, more... Uh, a, a, a depleted planet of fewer, worse opportunities that is just simply less pleasant to be human on. And it's, it's not our right to do it. And I think, um, I hope that conservatives will understand that there is still something that they have to partner with hard-headed progressives about because we've got problems we haven't solved yet, which is how do you, how do, you do good governance without it becoming captured and being malignant Right or failing to protect the things that future generations are entitled to have. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's where, as a progressive, um, 
we get a lot of ideas and we need the conservatives to help rein us in. 100%. Uh, Cuz we we like those ideas. <laughs> yeah, you don't <laughs> you, know? you don't want to unleash the the progressives without the constraint no, of somebody saying we need the leash. You you need somebody Something. who pays attention to the unintended consequences yeah. of your, you know, your solutions because they are they're always there. But conversely, there needs to be somebody who's saying, "Hey, this doesn't look like it's working out. We need to shift." You know. Right. And uh so that's that's what I guess we find ourselves doing. I'm curious um, to put on your game theory hat. If we were to try to make, not even make it, see, I'm talking like a progressive. If we were going to make something, um, <laughs> a system where individuals weren't penalized for turning back over control of the landscape to beavers, especially in these areas where historically beavers have maintained this system that yep. we have a lot of um, interest in seeing into the future. Um, how could that look in a in a, a resilient, game theoretically resilient um, way? You know how how can we how can we create something and it's going to involve governance right because it, there needs to be some like larger po party that's that's putting forth a program yeah um but where people who are stewards of land and trying to make a living off of land aren't penalized for um turning over that land to a rodent steward right right now it, and it, you know as somebody who owns a little bit of land i get it Right. Sure. The last thing you want is you, you buy some piece of land and you've got some idea for it. And then suddenly a sacred animal shows up and starts uh, moving stuff around and you're not allowed, to, you know, your piece of land's value just radically shifted on you. Right. And yeah. Uh, and there's regulations that come in if that wetland becomes a wetland of an official sense on the county. You know, I mean, right. Yeah. No, you're you're praying for, you know, not, no beavers in my backyard. Yeah, it's kind a, of a uh, thing. Yeah, I get yeah. it. Um, on the other hand. I think the problem is you, you've got to get the, the pieces of the puzzle that are disjointed to meet, right? If we all like the kind of world that uh, a highly active beaver population produces, but we none of us want to pay the price of uh, keeping that thing functioning, um, then, you know, there's a natural interaction of those two things, which is that there is a small price to be paid um, and my, my biggest concern about it is how do you discover what, you know, we're not going to turn North America back over to the beavers. Yeah. It's not going to happen. But it doesn't mean that you couldn't figure out, well, how much, you know, where can we effectively allow this activity to, um, uh, to take on its, uh, its full scale? And where can't we... Uh, afford not to have it. I mean, one of the things we haven't even talked about yet, it's not just this water cycle, but it, it's all sorts of other things that preoccupy us, like fire. Yeah, yeah. All the all of our preoccupations, you know, fire, water security, carbon sequestration. I mean, you've got anaerobic wetlands sequestering carbon. Uh, these are all things we're spending billions of dollars on. Um, yeah. And I spent almost a decade running a restoration program where I spent a lot of money. Um, and, you know, I was, I was doing these projects and the, and the way that everyone's putting these projects out, you know, we're going to, we're going to save salmon. And, and there's a bit of a reckoning right now because it doesn't seem to be working. Um, we're spending money, but it's not working. And then, and then over, you know, nobody's paying attention to a little, piece of land and a beaver starts doing its thing and pretty soon you have a system that i can't build with a million dollars of restoration funds right you know and it, it my projects don't hold a candle to that um, yeah it's it's uh but they did it for free right they did it for free because it was in their interest to just do it yeah um and you know increasingly i mean this is the lesson of biology right when, when heather and i say welcome to complex systems that is us effectively needling people for failing to understand 
that, you know, the, again and again, they walk into a complex system and they think they understand it and they think they're going to improve it. And mm-hmm. they, you know, in the end, are scratching their head. Well, that, that should have worked. And it's like, right. no, it shouldn't have worked. You didn't understand a fraction of what you needed to understand to make this happen. You know, presumably the beavers don't understand it in conscious terms either, but they intuit how you interact with these systems. And um, so anyway, the punchline to almost all of these puzzles is the lighter handed your intervention is, the better, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And, you know, this is a... And can you successfully kick something off that's an evolved complex system where you can stand back and say my work here is done you know what's the little push that gets right because in the habitat restoration world we've uh kind of fallen into a little bit of a trap maybe set for ourselves by um doing too much ecology where we you know measure things and we then describe an ecosystem based on what we've measured, you know, this many stems of this species, this many stems of this species. And um, a lot of the restoration world is caught up in then, you know, well, here's what a reference site, that, I mean, that's what the term, right? A reference site looks like. And so then I'm going to go build an analogous site over here. You know, it might be a cattle pasture right now, but I've got Tonka toys that burn diesel and right. a big budget and... Um, and then what happens is we build these artifices, you know, we, we build what we think would look like habitat, but we've, we haven't keyed into beaver as a verb or whatever the underlying process is that actually resulted in that habitat. You know, habitat's just the product of a bunch of process that consistently works upon a system. And so we go build something that looks like it and it looks like it for one or two years and then it starts falling apart because of entropy, like there's nothing maintaining that, right? Right. Um, and that's, that's a huge blind spot and the way we've been going about fixing things. Um, it's not, what can we do to turn a complex evolved system on again? It's, well, how can we construct this idea of beautiful and healthy? Yeah, I mean, it, it, that's such a tragic, tragic story because, you know, once or twice and then you ought to begin to realize what you're doing wrong, which is assuming that, you know, the proxies that you are using to indicate what's taking place in one of these habitats are not the sum total of the story. And the number of things that have to work together is large. And the chances that you've missed one are near certain, at least one. And the thing about, you know, whatever the beaver is, it intuits these things, right? I mean, if you compare just in your mind you know, the, um, the guy with the excavator and his intuition about exactly how, where, and in, you know, in what fashion to dig versus this animal with millions of years of built up experience that causes it to intuit these things. There's no comparison. And you know, what's more, the dude with the excavator goes home at night. Mm-hmm. Right. The mm-hmm. beaver's there. And presumably there's a feedback where the beaver understands something about what it had tried to do didn't quite work and it needs a little and you know it's 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 a i mean really in some sense you captured it beaver is a process Mm -hmm. right it is an animal but it's also a process and that process is way better than anything that you're going to be able to describe in a publication and you know deploy and you know get a crew of people to to bring into the world it just doesn't work that way Right. Yeah, I mean, our publications are useful in that we can go into the, a beaver wetland and we can say, hey, look, it actually is sequestering carbon or, yep. you know, hey, look, <laughs> there actually is a massive amount of insects here where we don't see insects elsewhere, you know, or we, we can take the constituent parts and admire them. Um, it seems to me an excellent tool for evaluating how effective something is. It does not strike me as particularly likely to describe what you should do. Architecting exactly. habitats, right. you know, you're talking about yep. you're talking about aesthetics. You're talking about better zoos. You're not talking about a, a habitat that works. And you know, it's the the biosphere project also mm-hmm. tells mm-hmm. this story because you would think 
you would think it is possible to enclose a space and make a system that is self-sustaining. You can make it simple enough. You can load anything in it that you want. You can put highly intelligent people there to troubleshoot. No, right? It doesn't work. Yeah. It's not to say it's impossible. Of course it's possible, but it's way harder than you think it is. Yeah. Right? Yep. I'm reminded, too, of this... Uh, I think it's one of the great cautionary tales, which nobody seems to to know. But there's this animal in in Madagascar called the Indri. You know it? No. It's a beauty. I'm, I'm one of the nobody seems to know. Well, it's a it's 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 the most marvelous creature in some ways. It's very surprising. Mm. Um, it looks like a big teddy bear, right? It's got big teddy bear ears. Has kind of a teddy bear face, and it's a large animal. Like I don't know, it must be sixty pounds something like this it's a, it's a lemurid it's not a true lemur but it's in that uh lives in trees yep yep monogamous uh locomotes by vertical grasping and leaping so hmm. it holds onto a tree and then it flings its arm nice. and lands in the next tree uh -huh. and bounces from one tree to the next amazing creature and to cap it all off the call of this thing is like humpback whale Right? Like imagine a humpback whale call in a forest. It's just a totally marvelous, very surprising creature. It's a folivore. eats leaves. Eats a lot of different kinds of leaves. Why? Because they're toxic. Yeah. Right? And so you Spread can't eat that around. Yeah. You want to deal with a bunch of different toxins at low levels rather than any heavy dose of any one toxin. But here's the thing. This animal would be a slam dunk winner in any zoo in the world that could have one. Mm. It's never been successfully kept in captivity. Mm -hmm. Right, you can't do it. There's no way that you can get a diet varied enough. Even worse, okay, they have literally tried to just put a limit on a piece of habitat that it's already in. Right, just put a fence around something big enough that the animal is just technically in captivity. It dies. Whoa. We just don't know enough, right? Yeah. So <laughs> something we're missing. <laughs> there's something we're missing. And mm -hmm. um, and I think the point is all of these puzzles are like this. We have to realize how early in the story of biology we are, right? We're just getting our bearings. And yeah, we know a lot and it's impressive, but it, you know, the degree to which we know a lot is nothing compared to the degree to which it is complex. Right. Right. And um anyway, the uh yeah, I mean, there's just, in, in thinking about beaver wetlands, there's just little hints of some of the, if you imagine all of the animals that were reliant on that predictable version of habitat, beavers managing habitat for thousands yep. of years. Uh, for example, trumpeter swans seem to specialize on nesting specifically on beaver lodges. Really? Yeah. And you read accounts of, you know, trumpeter swans were ubiquitous as a topping for the beaver lodge, right? Which makes sense. It's a beautiful place to put a nest, sure. right? Um, protected. Protected. And you've got a moat around you, yeah. right? Um, got an alarm system. Got an alarm system. Yeah, that beaver's going to be out there slapping, slapping its, tail its tail if it sees anything in the undergrowth. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just, just kind of realizing there's a whole world of... Um, other forms of life that are reliant on this predictable system, and we're not going to understand all of them. So let's go. We're not going to do an exhaustive list, but what are what are the kinds of creatures you're thinking of beyond trumpeter swans? Okay, so you've got a couple things that are less visible that beavers are doing, or maybe not less visible, but we don't think about them as much, right? So one of the things that we all look at is the beaver dam, and it's spreading out water laterally across the landscape. Um, they're also moving literally tons of vegetation from outside the stream system into the stream system, right? We've got this nerdy term in biology, alochthonous, right? Alochthonous inputs. It's like from one space out down into another. So, so you've got a system where um, this rodent is probably driving much of the food web within the stream, mm. right? Because it's the, enriching the stream. Yeah, enriching the stream. I mean, we think about like fall leaves. Yep. Right? But this this animal is churning vegetation into the stream. And in fact, folks who are snorkeling for looking for, you know, juvenile fish often refer to these collections of chewed on beaver sticks as river reefs because you snorkel up to them and it's all fish eyeballs staring out at, at you. It's this aggregation, you know, and all the little inverts are there. And then the fish and its cover, and so there's 
I mean, that's one example of just like something that's kind of invisible, like the, yeah, they well, chill and, and sticks. And that, um, that suggests a whole other process too, because one of the weird things about salmon is they make no sense in the streams that they're in. They're mm -hmm. not a stream creature. They're an ocean creature, which is breeding in these streams, right? And, you know, you could, it's obvious when you watch them go upstream and they're like, you know, too tall to fit in some little section of this stream. Like, this is a giant ocean predatory fish, mm -hmm. you know, breeding in this riparian habitat and then dying. But the thing is, okay, well, what does that do? This thing is effectively fanning out into the Pacific, right? Collecting marine resources in yep. huge numbers, dragging them against gravity up a mountain and then leaving them. Yep. Right? Yep. That's, that is a powerful process, right? That is nutrients going uphill to enrich those ecosystems. And now you're telling me that beavers are having this important... Um, encouraging effect on that process yeah and i mean if you're a fish it really only makes sense to go through all that expensive <laughs> that's right I, for, I forget sometimes it's hard to remember yeah. but I, I think i'm a fish too you that, are yeah. you are definitely okay. a fish um well if you're a fish that specializes in hauling your carcass up before depositing it uh you'd want to do that if the habitat you're putting your offspring in ensures like it's really good, right? Yeah. It ensures success. And so having a obsessive rodent that's like, come summertime, there's going to be water here. Right. You know, and I'm feeding the bottom of the food web. Yeah. You know, there's and I'm creating all water, this cover. And there's food for all the, the little fry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's, you can see how all these things. The fish fit. going up the stream doesn't make sense when it's standing out of the water. Yeah. But that's a stream that's degraded down into a ditch too. Oh, true. You know, so, so we... Even with watching salmon go up and you're like, why did, why, you know, they're, they're spawning often across the Pacific Northwest in a incredibly degraded and landscape. Depleted, yeah. Depleted stream you know, and, and if you look at even the, like the Oregon coast coho, the main thing that's highlighted as, well, we could probably get it off the endangered species lift if is juvenile rearing habitat. So where the little ones grow up. Yeah. And the one thing they point to is, well, we need more beaver dams if... You know. So I think the answer to your earlier question then is in part, if people understood, I mean, I don't know that this connection makes sense, but you're talking about the alteration of weather based on the distribution of water heavily affected by um, beaver activity. So do the skiers know that the depth of snow and the quality of the snow that they're interacting with is affected by, you know, beavers? I don't know that it is, but probably it is, at least somewhat. Maybe it's a lot. Do, you know, the sport fishermen, right, who are uh, fishing for salmon out, you know, in the sea, do they know that the, you know, that their success rate is dependent on beavers, you know, upland beavers? Probably if they do only, you know, yeah, only, only a couple. Little. Yeah. <laughs> so the question is, do people drinking water? Right. <laughs> you know? No. <laughs> right. Water, which has turned so terrible in my lifetime, right? Mm. Water almost everywhere is kind of gross to drink. And it's amazing that wasn't true. That's why I hide in the hills. Right. It's mainly where the water having is good, good water. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. It's, it was, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. It's a huge deal. People are drinking water that's compromised. Heavily compromised and to the point of being distasteful. It's not yep. even trace amounts. It's mm -hmm. significantly. That's degraded. your body saying, go find other water. Other water. Yeah. This, yeah. this is not your, this is water. If you're, if you're dying of thirst. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, beaver dams, that's another thing we didn't talk about, but you've got sediment accumulating behind beaver dams. Yep. Well, that leads to cleaner water, right? Sure, you've got it's a, a filter filter system built yep. in and and a lot of things that you know cities are struggling with is one clean water and two as you cover soil with asphalt mm -hmm. and concrete and buildings then when you get a deluge of rain yep 
it all runs off really quickly. really quickly yeah yep. sweeping a lot of the crud from humanity with oh, it yeah you know and so we have these huge pulses of water through the systems that are still streams Right? It right. goes way up and then it slacks way down. So then it erodes without soaking in. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have both a problem with, uh, you know, the water being dirty, but then you also have a problem with like too much at once. And so what do you have a beaver dam? Well, you have a filter and a speed bump. And so you've got enough of those speed bumps and you increase the residency time of the flood yep. too. Right? So these catastrophic things where then you see downstream towns getting just havoc being wreaked yep. by these floods. Well, if you had more speed bumps higher in the system, that would be retaining some of that sediment that's moving, you know, cleaning the water up, um, but also increasing the residence time before it's just this charging torrent. Charging torrent that washes off uselessly into the sea. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it washes our soil and our water. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. Oh, man, that's really powerful. Now, I will tell you, years ago, there, there was a... I don't remember if you and I ever went to it together, but there was a a beaver wetland near Evergreen. Um, I explored that wetland. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, at the moment, I'm not remembering its name. Do you? No. Grass Lakes. No. No. Uh, there anyway. was a there was a couple of beaver dams just near campus, and in fact, the first beaver that I saw in the wild. Yeah. Uh, I was waiting for the 41 bus at Red Square. And this beaver wanders out of the slough. <laughs> just like, what was it doing there? I don't know. And it like wandered over to the smoker's tent. Oh, it was smoking. Yeah. That's, that's why. <laughs> Everyone stopped and the bus was late. And uh, I kicked myself for not like getting out and going and following it. Right. I don't know what it was yeah, up to. What was it up to? Yeah. It just then wandered back into the slough. And that was my first beaver sighting. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's good. But yeah, Evergreen had beavers. So yeah, there were, Presumably there were still does. definitely beavers in yeah. the habitat. And then this one place, which I think I'm embarrassed to say, I'm not sure that when I first started going there that I knew that it was beaver created. Mm -hmm. right? It was a large body of water. And at some point I figured out it was a, a, a beaver created body of water. And I started exploring the dam and it was a huge structure. You know, I had entire classes walk out onto this thing mm. and stand there to talk about um beavers and their implication and you know extended phenotype and whatever else but i remember one year uh i think it was particularly heavy rainfall and the beaver dam burst oh yeah yeah and it was crazy it was just the thing like emptied and it didn't empty all the way it emptied down to a much lower height than it had been and then, so I, you know, of course, had the biologist's overreaction to this, that this was like the end of that uh -huh. habitat. Uh -huh. Yeah, not the end no. of that. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> you know beavers, what they did was they fixed the damn thing. Yep. And it filled right back up. And uh, so what this leads me to wonder is that dam is anti-fragile. Mm. It's bound, at, mm. you know, every weak spot is the place where it's going to burst. And those beavers are presumably not putting it back just the way it was, but, I mean, building it in such a way that it is probably growing stronger over time. And so... Yeah, the dams that are most likely to fail are the new ones. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Makes good sense. Yep. So then what you're also describing is a self-assembling, self-upgrading filter system. Mm -hmm. Right. You're talking about a sequence of beaver habitats that are, you know, dampening that pulse of water, filtering the water as it comes through, slowing it down so it's able to soak into these habitats, making them richer and wetter habitats. Right. That's a process that gets better over time. And um, I mean, I guess I don't I, I there's a part of me that doesn't want to introduce tech here at all, but uh -huh. Just as an analogy, imagine, imagine that Elon Musk, right, had a secret robot project <laughs> in which he had uh, these little robots which were going to terraform some landscape, obviously being prepared for a trip to Mars where they were going to improve landscapes over time and make them hospitable to a series of creatures that would then be, you know, introduced. We'd think this was, you know, incredibly marvelous technology. Yeah. But here it is. It's happened. 
on its own completely. We all know the name of the thing. Most of us do not understand how profound its impact on North America has been. And, uh, um, and we, because we don't understand what it has produced, because every time we see a flat-bottomed, you know, fertile valley, we don't think that is the work of past beavers that I am looking at. We don't really, we don't know enough to lament the fact that the beavers aren't there, and therefore that th there's a, a clock ticking. Mm -hmm. It's not going to last. Yeah, that, fer that fertility, right? There's a clock ticking. There's a clock ticking. Yeah. And so I think the answer to the question that you asked is somehow we've got to close the logical loops on this system. So the point is, again, I don't know if skiing is a good example of something mm -hmm. that's benefited, but it at least would work in that direction. You like skiing? Think about the beavers and their role in it. I know that sounds crazy, but it's not, right? Right. You like salmon? Here's the role that they're playing there, right? You know, do you like affordable food, right? Well, here's the, the... In the Mars context, people would get it. Yeah, right. You like living on Mars? Well, you still need these robots doing the thing that's maintaining the system of life support. Right. That's right? the thing. If you did this on Mars, the point is, you know, if you don't know what an equilibrium is, mm -hmm. you're fired. <laughs> right? Because <laughs> that's fatal. Yeah. Right? You need to know anytime you're intervening in a system where you're depleting something, you're, inter you're interfering with an equilibrium, and those equilibria are necessary for life. And the point is, that's what we're doing, but nobody's fired for not knowing what an equilibrium is. Right? right. And right. Um, it is not uh, unpredictable where that ends. Right? That ends with us scratching our heads at how so many things that were once grand are no longer functional and, you know, it's totally needless. Which is what we're doing already, but it's only going to get more pronounced. It's only going to get more pronounced. And, you know, you're flying over the landscape looking at the opposite of beavers, right? Mm -hmm. Those, what you call them? Yeah, the pivots. The pivots. My mom had a, a good analogy. She's like, uh, we were talking about it, and it's like uh, looking at mosquito welts. You know, you're, you're sucking this life force out of the landscape and it's causing this inflammation yeah this little circular welt right and that's productive for us right now we're growing food there but you can only have so many mosquitoes right right yeah <laughs> there's a point at which there's no there's no more lymph there yeah and uh yeah yeah, yeah well i um i hope we can close some of those circles so that um people you know I, I think, you know, what what I hope people get, will get from this discussion is that a topic that probably most people thought they had no interest in turns out to have a thousand fascinating and even if you're not fascinated by them, important facets, right? Right. Um, right. You know, fire suppression is not a small matter here in the West. This is a serious issue that we deal with. The smoke that comes off these fires, even when the fires are remote, the degradation in the quality of life you know, as a result of a failure to understand equilibria with respect to um, the natural process of fire that, you know, removes the fuel at a particular rate where, you know, we had, what, a hundred years of fire suppression that resulted in a huge buildup of fuel so that when the fires burn, they decimate the landscape, yep. right? Mm -hmm. That's a failure to understand equilibria. And what I learned from you is that actually beavers are also uh, an important factor in suppressing fire by adjusting the way water flows through these ecosystems. Um, so, you know, are, are you interested in fire suppression in the West? Well, if you live in the West, you better be, right? Because you're going to be breathing the consequences otherwise or driven out of your home or whatever. Yep. So, so anything more to say about um, beavers and, and fire? Uh, I had the experience of... Um responding so i volunteer with search and rescue and i responded to a fire uh, i guess it's two years ago now that burnt two of the nearby towns down um more or less uh, phoenix and talent uh, and there's a greenway that connects all of these towns in the rogue valley um you know a, a really great thing right somebody said hey we want a greenway let's buffer the creek let's give it a lot of room let's put a bike path in yeah i believe i've ridden 
repeatedly down there when I when Heather uh, got me a bike building course in oh, in Ashland. In They're Ashland. famous for that. Yes, yep. that course. Um, yeah. I used to ride uh, that Greenway all the time. Yeah, before the fire. Before the fire. So go ahead. What happened? Yeah. So there? so we had some intense winds and somebody started a little fire that became a big fire. Um, that Greenway, which to our human perspective looked like verdant, healthy habitat, acted like a wick, and it it drew fire through two cities wow uh, you know and we imagine fire coming in from the hills and like right. time to escape this way but no this was it never even went into the hills it drew fire through these cities because the stream had collapsed down into a ditch the water was unavailable it was down there right and people got used to that it's like a creek you know something you look right. down on right and and even in that context where we had a really wide space where people hadn't actually built close to it the fact that the creek was collapsed meant that plants that could take advantage of this novel niche, like blackberry, had mm. fully colonized this entire riparian area, right? If if there was water that was all over the place and it was this messy, braided, marshy thing, you know, blackberry don't do well in that, right. right? And the native plants that we're lamenting the loss of would be doing excellently well because that's what they are used to, right? But instead, instead of having a fire buffer, instead of having something that wouldn't burn, we had something that was extremely explosive uh, when it came to a, a spark. Right. It was productive with exactly the wrong exactly stuff. Exactly the wrong stuff. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I remember s standing at a roadblock that I was helping to maintain at that point near the creek. And uh, you could just hear like people's propane tanks exploding and the, the valley was glowing. And, you know, two towns burning down puts off a lot of light. Um, mm -hmm. And... Yeah, looking at the creek and just realizing, wow, this is what we've wrought um, by allowing these systems to collapse out, to allowing that soil to dry up, these novel niches where then we get this dense vegetation, um, you know, it has consequences. Has huge consequences. And so the reverse is true, too, with, with beavers and fire, where you have a system where beavers are maintaining a landscape that's wetted. You see wildlife run to that when there's a fire. A lot of folks that work cattle will see their cattle go to the beaver wetlands when there's a fire on the east side you know, of Oregon. Or So there have got to be two reasons for that, I would guess. Um, one, the activity of the beaver is fire suppressive in nature. But two, the choice of beavers to, to alter a particular piece of habitat may be responsive to it being resilient to fire because if you because remember the other ecosystem engineer that's been operating the same timeline people were make, burning we're making making, we're making use of fire. fire yeah right so there was a boundary between the two ecosystem engineers right. uh, that had to be maintained that had to be maintained and you can imagine let's say that you had a beaver that was naive about fire mm-hmm and it was very good at engineering, and it mo modified some habitat that was particularly prone to fire, then the point is, well, that's a short-term project too, right? Because to the extent that the beaver is dependent on, you know, the trees in the riparian zone uh, surviving, then the point is it made an error, yeah. right? building in a place that had an Achilles heel. So anyway, yeah, you could, uh, you could see both of those processes at work, and you could see augmentation Right. Whereas again, in the West, we have um, uh, a plague of eucalyptus trees. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. I presume beavers do not utilize eucalyptus. I've never heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. Although they will go after incense cedar, which has a pretty pungent. Uh, it it does seem to be rare though, and they seem to mostly use it for building things with, and not eating it. Yeah, building with cedar makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Especially in an aquatic setting, right? We right, do that too. totally, exactly. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing is too, in the context of fire, if you have a degraded system that don't, doesn't have beavers, um, maybe it's super incised. And so they can't, every time they try to build a dam, it can't persist because the velocity is just too much. It's like a bowling alley yeah. of water every winter and it blows beaver dams out, which is the case with Bear Creek, for example, from my, from my valley. Um, and that's usually because we've straightened it or what have you, but that would happen naturally in some systems too, if something catastrophic happened and you get this channelization and, um, well then 
that's an especially fire prone situation because beavers can't mm. maintain that. And you do get a fire that's a stand replacing fire. Well, sand replacing fires, then you have a lot of accumulated woody debris that starts crashing down in that stream. And your velocity barrier is suddenly not such a thing anymore because you've got all this roughness and tangled burned wood that starts catching the sediment that comes off the fire because you know sediment's moving once a fire <laughs> fire landscape through, gets yeah. late. Yeah, it gets rained on. Um, fires are a reset for a system that beavers are hard to find hard to to utilize to utilize and suddenly you've got something where every single one of the hardwoods is bouncing back with fresh new shoots you've gotten rid of the conifer layer that you know beavers don't really find palatable anyway and all those are racked up in the stream and you've got a, you've hit reset and now it's ready for beavers the, the tragic thing is of course then what we usually do is we go clean out every single stick that falls in the creek because we're worried about flooding implications and so right. it only makes it worse oh my um, goodness but the the intelligence of the system being what it you know fires could be a good thing for beaver too and that they prep it prep a habitat that's inaccessible to be more accessible again yeah that's interesting i i like that concept of uh of reset and it is a kind of a hopeful one right even a place that isn't beaver hospitable because the velocity of the water is too high can as a natural process can find itself within range of you know beaver architecture that's cool we don't have to wait for wildfire we could go stick sticks in the creek you know <laughs> well let me <laughs> and ask people you this. do yeah you you could you could encourage the beavers in yep. that way um and presumably my guess would be that the beavers actually detect the reset that the consequences of fire might cause beavers to go into explorer mode um, mm -hmm. because it may be possible that some piece of habitat that wasn't useful is now useful. Um, but presumably they are in explorer mode enough just by virtue of producing offspring. Uh, yeah, and it actually seems like the adults themselves um, go into explorer mode every summer. So there's accounts dating back 150 years of naturalists noticing that you know like where did the beavers go in july and august and it does appear that beavers will go assess the surrounding landscape and check in and then they come back and they keep investing or they don't you know so one of the things we see happen on the landscape sometimes is like you know there's a nearby colony and it gets trapped off and it's in better habitat than this other colony. While well, they go into explorer mode that summer, they find out, hey, those digs are open. Yeah. And then they jump ship on this one and they move downstream. So what happens then in the context of some human who is having a disagreement with beaver at their driveway culvert, you know, the, yep. the pipe where the water is supposed to go through and beavers plug it and they're like, ha ha, you know, that human left one hole in a perfectly good dam. Right. And oh, goodness. <laughs> Now I've identified that, I've fixed the issue, we now have flooding. Um, so people get on this treadmill of trapping beavers. Trapping beavers and they get very replaced by... And they get replaced by other beavers in the landscape who have identified, no, that's the better habitat. And so you have a population sink. You have a black hole. All right. Right? So you can have just one person one, who's one just person kind of trapping struggling. out beavers depleting land that they are not actually trying to keep beavers out of. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But because that was the preferred habitat then you're going to see depletion and probably because of that explorer mode, yeah. you know, and, and we've seen this where, um, you know, a whole little sub watershed will be full of beavers and then some land ownership will change and the new landowner is intolerant and they happen to be at the best beaver habitat. And over the course of the year, they or two or five, they trap a lot of beavers and suddenly there's no other beavers around, Wow, you know, oh, that's such a terrible story. Yeah, I mean, it's also encouraging, I guess, in that usually folks don't want to be trapping beavers and right. they're on that treadmill and it's frustrating for them too. So kind of helping folks think through, you know, can can the monkeys outsmart the rodents? Generally you can't, or the fish outsmart the fish. Is, right. You know, <laughs> it doesn't it's quite have the fish. same rate. No, that's confusing. Um, yeah, but, but 
the promise in doing that is like if you can identify those population sinks, if you can identify those black holes where yeah, where, where folks are struggling yep. and you know they may it's just a pest species, whatever. Um, it can have profound impacts on the entire, you know, square miles of. Are you talking habitat. about by getting them to rethink getting rid of the beavers? Or it mm -hmm. seems to me that if you could, I mean, it's a weird thing to advocate for, but if they're going to be a black hole for beavers through this process, getting them to reduce the quality of that habitat that they're trying to keep beavers out of so that other beavers don't adopt it would also have that effect. It would, yeah. It would be probably very illegal in most areas. Because, really? Yeah, because our wetlands are so well protected legally mm. um, that you can't purposely degrade a wetland. And that's part of the fear that people feel when a beaver shows up. It's like, now I'm going to have this animal that's going to encumber my property with additional regulation. Right. You know, quick, <laughs> off it before <laughs> it starts doing stuff. Yep. Um, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but yes, that's true. If your if your property was in a degraded state, um, in comparison to other adjacent properties, then you could predict the beavers are going to occupy the next best available habitat. And what we often see is if you have too many population sinks, then beavers the the only beavers you see are the ones that are living on rivers because mm. life is peachy on a river. Man, you can have a bank den. Right. You've got all the willow you could ever eat. The water's deep. No need to build a dam. Yeah. Right. And um, as long as there's always room, they never hit carrying capacity, right? Like not all the spots are filled on the river, then no juvenile's ever going to have to go make a living higher up in a stream where you got to build a dam and life is more work and water is scarce. Um, and so that, you know, people will say, oh, we have enough beavers they're in all these systems but we're living in a uh I've, I've heard the term like functionally extirpated right yeah and that yes there's beavers but functionally right they're in no longer a verb so my guess based on what you've said is that the river beavers are present but they are not as valuable that the work that they do is not in a position to to have this fire suppressive or right they're not managing water yeah they're not they're, they're cycling nutrients still sure yeah. you know but it's we selfishly as people looking at this we need it to be at the point where the river's so chock-a-block full of beavers that the young ones are forced to go out and do real work do some work yeah yeah right right yeah uh, that's uh interesting and and uh quite quite sad really it's interesting that it's the same animal that can do this on a river and um and managing upland habitat yeah well and that's cool too right because you can take a, a river beaver and go stick it upland and it's like damn it and right? it does exactly that it does a thing <laughs> which actually makes sense if you think about it because you probably have a you know, a population level phenomenon where the rivers are the thing that links all of these disjointed upland habitats. And so, you know, it would be really interesting to know, maybe you do know, what the relationship is between the river populations and all of these little uh, tributaries in the hills. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't. There's been some genetic studies done and basically it says, you know, beavers are more related and, um, watersheds and then they are in the next watershed over you know but it didn't really yeah, tell that's not that surprising <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. um is anything known about how many generations a particular you know a large dam and lodge represent how long a particular lineage of beavers will uh, manage a particular piece of habitat well it's kind of like the big whales right we went killed them all and then we we're looking back at historical records and we we're like that whale was way bigger than anything we see now how old was it right no idea you know it's yeah. that bowhead whale that they found a 200 year old stone point in yeah and they're like okay well we know they get to 200 yep right um we're in a similar position with beaver because yep. where are the places that we didn't go trap out beavers and bust beaver dams there's one spot in the boreal forest where there's a beaver dam you can see from space it's clearly been there a long time. Wow. Um, and it's shifted so much of the landscape that it's a, it's a spot you can identify. Um, but yeah, these, I, the, the, uh, 
life cycle of a beaver dam in a place where there's a lot of sedimentation, right, where the where the water turns murky in the winter, <laughs> um, is that that will accumulate behind the beaver dam, and eventually you'll get a meadow. Yep. You know, back to it being flat because of beaver dams. Yep. Right. But the water has to go somewhere, so it'll be threaded through, or maybe it'll be over on this side now more than that side, and um, beavers will be building additional dams. And so it's this process of um, uplift, right? And uh, yeah, creating land. Actually. Creating land. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, those cycles are iterative where you'll have, you know, ghosts of beaver kingdoms, you know, b- buried underneath the new meadows that have been formed more recently, right? It's, um, yeah. So, so a beaver dam that exists for a really long time uh, as one dam I would predict that there's not a lot of sediment coming in, I guess, is, you know, where mm, you have because to otherwise it would have otherwise turned it would into sediment. a meadow. Yeah. Yep, yep. Okay. Well, that makes... There's no reason these things didn't last a really long time, hundreds of years yeah. right, or more. And uh, again, it's going to be compromised by the fact that we're all, we're looking at modern stuff and we don't necessarily know what the, the pre, pre-Columbian or maybe even pre-human uh, situation was. Yeah, and a, and a beaver dam that's old, even twenty years old, you can't tell it's a beaver dam, right? I mean, that's the that's the great yeah, thing, that's right the the classic like oh lattice work of sticks, that only lasts for two or three years, yeah. and then it looks like a landscape, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're funny. You have to identify them by the fact that the water is behaving in a way differently you there. Expect it yes, to do. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, what is the largest beaver body of water? that is known oh i don't know i don't know it's a good question and that because there's you could measure that two way like tallest beaver dam right right and you could measure laterally out beavers when they when they so so say you've got an incised system right uh, incised meaning that the creek has collapsed into this trench yeah and beavers successfully build a dam there at first it kind of looks like the hoover dam in a sense i mean it's just this plug right um but then quickly, if they get out on the on the valley floor, they start chasing the water with a really usually pretty low dam mm-hmm. initially. Yeah, and and they are remarkably adept at more or less tracing the topography lines. So if you look at a beaver dam from above, and then you were to overlay a topo line map yeah. at sufficient detail, that dam, you know, every decision that they made in making that would overlay well with topography. Well, it makes sense because water is self-leveling. Exactly. So all you have to do is make a decision the next inch over, yeah, <laughs> you <right>. know, <laughs> right? And so then they'll chase that usually to the valley edges and then those things start going up and then some of that blows out, but then they catch it down lower. And so nice. it's back to it being a process, right? Like yeah. the dam itself, um, very quickly, if this process is working, you can't point to and say, this is the dam. In a simplified system, it's really easy to say, well, that's the primary dam. That's the dam that they use to back up water over their denning situation. These are auxiliary dams. These are just facilitating habitat, right? Yeah. But then as soon as it actually really starts working, it's all kind of unclear. Well, I feel wet. better now that I didn't spot <laughs> that that wetland near uh, near Evergreen was yeah, a, a beaver it suggests that it's more mature and developed. Yeah, it was definitely yeah. it was definitely a long standing um, spot. Pretty pretty nifty. Um, is there before we move on from this topic? Is there anything more on uh, beaver natural history that we ought to know? You've talked about the lodges. Talked a bit about the dams. Um, I would point out that they're vegetarians. Um, yeah, they're vegetarians, but they're not annoying about it. No, no. <laughs> They, uh, it's a terrible they keep it, they keep it. They're kind of like, you know, that that family in the neighborhood who they homeschool and they're vegetarians and they're like obsessively gardening all the time. Yes, and, and they have huge tails. And... <laughs> Everyone else is just like, they might be onto something, but we can't quite tell what's going on in there. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's the beavers. That's the beavers. Yeah. You know, we kind of look in and we're like, mm, they've, they, you know, are they simple or are they the deepest thinkers in the block? Right. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> we don't know. Yeah, um, so in Tales of Narnia, the beavers serve fish to the lost children. And I don't know if that's the origin of the rumor that beavers eat fish. Mm. Um, but there's a pretty pronounced rumor that beavers eat fish. And, you know, they don't. They're vegans. Um, yep. I think the, the more interesting part of the Tales of Narnia is it's actually the beavers that are guiding humanity through this 
um, landscape that is having an ecological crisis. Um, uh, you know, if we're going to draw any analogy, right, that, that one's a helpful sounds one. Insightful, um, yeah. Getting distracted by, I mean, they were also, I think, drinking beer too. So, uh, <laughs> got to pass the time somehow. <laughs> I know. Yeah, um, yeah. I feel like we covered diet, and uh, the one thing that uh, in the natural history piece that people don't necessarily notice first too is that beavers dig a lot. And you probably saw this when the dam collapsed, mm -hmm. but the topography is highly complex. It's not just a basin of mud when a dam, there's movement channels and mud has been moved here and yeah. scraped away from there. And the canals that go out into the landscape to facilitate, you know, beavers knock something down, but it's 40 yards away from the creek. Well, they can float it out on a canal. And so they're doing a lot of digging as well. And when you wade through a beaver dam or dammed area, a beaver pond, what you'll notice is the temperature differences are pretty staggering. You'll be in a really cold area and then you move into a really warm area and then you'll back, be back in cold, you know, all in the same pond. To us, it just looks like a pond, yep. right? And there's complex things happening with upwelling because of all the water being forced down into the landscape where, you know, there's, I guess, the other persistent kind of um, mark against beavers people will trot out as well don't they warm the water that's a lot of solar radiation you're collecting right but uh, they're missing a, a below ground process where this water is sinking in and upwelling and when you start thinking about like the frogs that need to oviposit in a warm shallow place but also the salmon fry that need a cold deep spot yeah. with cover um, it, you, you can kind of start to peak peer at why this has worked you know right. for all these various life forms that need various types of habitat yeah, they're creating diverse opportunities mm -hmm. in this single in the single wetland yeah and, and we get used to measuring streams in like linear miles but if we were honest about what a healthy stream looks like it should be acres you know right it be laterally it's not a side. line it's not a line it's not a it's line. Not a line and there was a good paper where they took a bunch of stream professionals at a conference somewhere and they're like draw a healthy stream you know here's a piece of paper and a pencil and um, consistently everybody drew a squiggly line that kind of did a little snake thing um, and these were the professionals right and so the blind spot is is pronounced you know the the, the healthy stream that is this sponge of habitat um, so is this why um the meadows in upper yosemite look the way they do i don't know i haven't spent much time with them it's, i mean it's unbelievable it's like they're almost um beyond their beauty is so staggering mm -hmm. right these just large uh, it you know it it looks like somebody with a very good eye has um made the most you know glorious i'm trying to avoid analogizing them to to a manufactured habitat but it just it's it's it, it strains credulity how mm -hmm. lovely these places are. But now that you talk about this, it does strike me um, as likely to have been a process that sort of took the you know the relatively small bounty of these very cold streams running through uh, the upper parts of Yosemite and drove it out yeah. uh, horizontally. Yeah, yeah. That's the that's the kind of ironic thing here um, is those systems that are being maintained in these processes, whether it was people burning yep. or it was beavers flooding, <laughs> yep. we find those aesthetically beautiful, right? But um, have still done away with both of those processes on mass, right? right. We're, we're dealing with the encroachment and the uh, degradation that results from that. Um, well we made we made the error that is maybe at the heart of um of our culture which is too too young in some sense to have become wise about this but we took that gorgeous thing and we consumed it mm -hmm. you know and we are still consuming it and um i i i think it's very clear in in the story that you tell but we ought to be like the beavers replenishing it right because it is 
you know, it is the stuff that high quality life is made out of. And yeah. And you know, it, there's a, there's an uplifting piece of that and that, um, I meet a lot of people who are struggling with feeling like, where is my niche as a human? Right. Yeah. You know, this like this guilt or the shame or fear, um, all these emotions that are even kind of seated in the present or the past. Right. But, but where, where's my spot? Um, where do I fit in? And I think as I've been advocating, we need to defer to the professionals when it comes to water systems. That's not our spot. Yeah. Um, but people were burning the uplands and maintaining just like beaver predictable habitat for the rest of the, eco the ecology for our own purposes, right? Yep. Facilitating better forage. Um, that's the spot. You know, I have, I have friends down in Yurok country who are still doing it the way that they've been doing for a thousand years, years. And those folks are very generous in, in teaching other humans. All right. You're ready to listen now. Yeah. <laughs> you know? All right. We, let's, let's talk. This is how it, so, so we have a, we have a role to play just as much as beavers that, you know, they're, there, there are forests that need tending yep. with flame, um, and so, uh, yeah, I think I think there's there's two parts there. It's like there is a role for us, but we need to we need to be clear eyed about which of the complex evolved systems we had a role in, and it wasn't the water. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Um, I do think that some of the wiser conservationists that I have known have had a sense that there's a kind of fetishizing of nature that is counterproductive and that yeah. basically all you know even the amazon we now understand was much more managed than we knew mm -hmm. right it's not a an untouched habitat it's an intensively touched habitat but we can take a lesson from that and i think there there are two lessons in tension one is we should manage these things to the benefit of humanity going forward. But two, managing them means as light a touch as possible. And, you know, sometimes as light a touch as possible may not be any, you know, using fire is not all that light a touch. It should be done well, but it, it may need to be done. Right. Light touch, but consistent with what the, pro the process that's led to our current ecology. Right. right. Uh, you know, yes. E <laughs> if we're going to do novel things, then we really need to be careful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I was actually going to mention that when you were talking about uh, those two towns having burned down, that one mm -hmm. of the things that happens when stuff burns down is it doesn't just burn down, but it liberates all the toxins that were involved in uh, that thing. Yeah. They go everywhere, right? You breathe them, they end up in the plants. They, it's terrible. Yep. Um, but in the case, you know, Maybe fire is a place where a slightly heavier hand is necessary, but it needs to be done in a way that does not disrupt those equilibria. And with respect to water, let the experts deal with it. I like that approach. I think that, that makes good sense. It requires some humility, which sometimes we as a species struggle with. <laughs> yeah, I've noticed that pattern about us. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, all right, let me, before we close this out, um, I think there's another thing that's probably worth exploring a little bit. Evergreen has been misunderstood because for most people it didn't exist in their minds until they saw it go crazy uh, in the episode that actually brought uh, Heather and, and me to, to prominence. And that has always been a bit of a bitter pill for us because Evergreen was simultaneously an amazing place and um, a tragic failure to live up to its potential. And, you know, before Evergreen blew up, we were basically voices shouting into the wind about the central flaw of the place, right? We wanted to cure it, and there was no appetite for curing it. And I wanted to just say what I think it was and then mm -hmm. talk a little bit about your experience because, frankly, I think if people got to know some of the folks who had graduated from Evergreen and gotten something out of it, they would have a very different sense that this wasn't a demonstration that a radical departure from the educational model was inherently a mistake, because it wasn't. Mm -hmm. So the flaw, as I see it, well, the beauty, I used to say Evergreen was 
uh, they, the founders threw out absolutely everything from a normal university or college and replaced it with something else. And half of what they did was brilliant and half of it was crazy. And yeah. that the only problem was that we never got around to saying, all right, which, which fraction doesn't work and getting rid of that. That would have been a perfectly good process. That would be the next step in the experiment, right? <laughs> sure should have been. <laughs> yeah. So the biggest flaw that I see, or the, the biggest value was that mm -hmm. professors were liberated to teach whatever they wanted to teach in whatever they, way they wanted to teach it, which sounds like a recipe for disaster. But the fact is, if you're interested in teaching, and the place was founded around the idea that teaching should be paramount, right? Um, but if you had an appetite to figure out what could be done that nobody had ever done before in a classroom, then you could do it. You could figure it out. And <clears throat> what people viewers, most of them will not know, is that that structure involved what were called full-time programs, where right. you, as a student, take one class full-time, professor teaches one class full-time, and those programs could go on for a full year. And what that does, especially with the, the low uh, professor-to-student ratio, was or the high professor to student ratio, the low student mm -hmm. professor ratio. But the uh, <clears throat> what that does is it means that professors and students know each other very, very well. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and it means that the professor, if they have an appetite for it, can figure out, you know, even down to the individual mind in the classroom, what is that person hung up on? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you know what's going on, and and that process is potentially great. Yeah. Right. That was yeah. the awesome part. Bad part was. And I would add to that yeah, that right. um, some of those full-time uh, programs were taught by multiple professors uh -huh. from across discipline. So in just painting the picture, that was that was part of it too. Yep. Right? It could it would, be... It would sometimes be a team of two or three professors that are ushering the same group of students through a program for a year. Yeah, team teaching. Yep. And um, those programs were... Often students didn't know this, but those programs were just inventions, right? One professor, professor sits down next to another professor someday and they have a conversation in which they're each focused on their own thing. And it's like, well, actually, this conversation is pretty good. I wonder if we could build uh, a program around that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the bad part, though, is you get hired at Evergreen, it's not obvious that just because you've got a PhD somewhere in some subject, that you're going to be any good at all at figuring out how to teach if you're completely free, right. right? Lots of people aren't. And so what I would have done if I had had the ability to, to fix it is after you're hired, there's a period of three years, maybe, maybe it would be five years in which you have to demonstrate that you can figure out what to do with all that freedom. And if at the end of that period you're doing a great job and students are feeling really, you know, energized by what you're doing, right, you stay. And if you can't figure it out in that period of time, doesn't matter how much we like you, you should go, right? Because that spot that you're in, that is a, you know, Evergreen, the faculty used to say, it didn't pay in money, it paid in freedom, mm -hmm. right? Those were glorious positions, not because of what they paid, but basically because if you were, if you had a taste for the work, Right, it was rewarding. You knew what you, you knew why you were there every day. Right, yeah. um, and so by not having that process in which we selected for people who actually were good at figuring out what to do with freedom, it resulted in basically there were some professors who were great, and there were some professors who basically used it as an excuse not to work. Right. So anyway, for somebody who clearly got a lot out of the thing. Um, I'd be interested to know what, you know, what your overarching, you, you were, how many classes with Heather and me did you take? Just the one. Just the one. Yeah. Yeah. Animal behavior and zoology. Animal behavior and zoology. Yep. Yeah. You were co-teaching it together. Yeah. Which I know you didn't always teach as a team, but that, that year you were teaching as a team. Yeah. We taught as a team that year, which we did a number of times. Um, and then we also had the experience of teaching separately and uh, there was a group of students who would bounce from one of our programs to the right. other, right? There was yeah. like a large group of students who were who had become interested in evolution as a result of the fact that there were two of us 
you know, teaching related topics and we had very different styles. And um, anyway, that seemed to work for a lot of people, even to the point that um, many students uh, would continue to show up for class even after they were no longer registered with one of us, even sometimes after they graduated, because they got so used to the idea that there was a community of people who spoke the same language that um, they would. I think I did that one year. I came through Olympia and I found out you were teaching in a lecture hall and I sat in on a lecture on gay dinosaurs. Gay dinosaurs, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, that would have been a lecture that um, that was part of a two-part lecture that I did where uh, a student, Colin, yep. who was quite paleontolog paleontologically expert, had teamed up with me. Uh, and so it, basically it was about the evolution of homosexuality, and I did the human part of it, which uh, was a topic I had become interested in. And he did a kind of survey of other things, and, and the you know the grand finale was... Gay dinosaurs, gay dinosaurs yeah. which you know it's amazing that clearly stuck with me yeah <laughs> right you remember it all these years later but all right so um what was your experience at evergreen to the extent that people don't understand what the place was what can you tell them yeah well so the hazard you identify was clear to me and i think to most of the students too you know you'd have this this thing called the academic fair where all the professors are sitting at individual tables and you, as a student, have the opportunity to decide where am I going to commit an entire year of my education. Yep. And that's risky business in that um, if you hit a stinker, it's a big it, waste. It's a big waste. And so that was both the, um, the strength and the weakness of this. Uh, back to your <laughs> get rid of the folks who don't know what to do with this. Um, I was in a navigate, trying to navigate a landscape where there were folks who knew what to do with it and folks who didn't. And as a student, you're coming into it and you're trying to assess. Um, and, and often the folks who did know what to do with it, their classes were waitlisted. There was a vicious process of trying to get in. I mean, I know with you and Heather, you always had waitlists. People were trying to get in. People were writing you love letters. You know? So many. <laughs> please, please, please. Right. Um, but once you were once you were in that cohort um, and you were invested for a year, I mean, you could do fantastic stuff. You could go take the entire cohort out of state for months on end. Yeah. Because why? Why they have don't the have college? Anything, they don't have anything else they're committed to doing. They don't have anything else they're committed to doing. Yeah. And like, if you don't need the lab, then right. Why? You know. Um, so, I thought that was. I loved Evergreen. I came to it with someone who, as someone too, who had a severe tracking difficulty, um, which you know I eventually worked on. But like, if I'm reading music or whatever at the time, I go one, two, five. Oh, back here, you know, hmm. which made it difficult. Yeah, yeah. Um, Evergreen was a place where those of us who had those sorts of, um, you know different different ways of learning learning disabilities right or whatever you want um it, it you could just kind of sweep it aside because it was a very different model it was like well where are you at on the content you know yep. and there's many ways to approach understanding the content um i remember uh so after your class i went to a class that was kind of pre-med school you know we got really deep in all the pre-med school subjects and um it was kind of stressful because uh, they was like, you know, oh, are you going to be a doctor or not? Even at Evergreen, they yeah. still somehow cultivated that vibe. Um, so I would get stressed out and take my fiddle down to a local pub every Wednesday night and play Irish tunes with folks. There was like a bottomless pitcher of dark ale and light ale for anyone who came in and could halfway play an instrument. Um, and that was my little stress release. I was talking to an old guy there at the pub, and he uh, told him I was an Evergreen student. He's like, well, yep, Evergreen, that's a, that's a school of deep divers and floaters. <laughs> <laughs> um, which was kind of my experience, too, with both teachers and students. And students, yeah. Um, you could choose to deep dive, and it was risky, and there was the promise of great reward. 
Or you could choose to like wear the water wings and four years later you pop out yeah. the other side like and you have, of you have a degree of value. <laughs> dubious yeah. value, but it's the same degree that any of the deep divers got too. Right. And there was this wonderful thing around rather than grades, you have the evaluated evaluative process where I write an evaluation of you. I say he was great except for his hair. (laughs) 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 You do the same and he was great except for his hair. Right, exactly. And then they match. And then they match. And then they're forever the record too. Right. (laughs) Um, But that was that was pretty cool too. I I really appreciated that. Um, You know, and and especially if you're through the same program for multiple terms, you're doing this evaluation at the end of every single term. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I mourn that that doesn't seem to be there anymore. I, it was, a, it was an amazing thing, um, uh, and I, I really got a lot out of it. I got a lot out of it from you and Heather. Um, I got a lot out of it. The next year, uh, I was able to do another independent study um, on whales with a local. Uh, graduate who started one of the premier research collectives in whale biology. Um, and I know who you're talking about, but you might. Yeah. Know. John Cal the yeah. Cascadia research collective. Uh, you know, he, he and a number of evergreen grads, this is what you could do with an evergreen yep. education, right? He, they graduated with bachelor's degrees and they started an independent science collective. Yeah. You know, which and, is important in whale research and actually bat research in in the uh, yeah. in the Puget Sound. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it because it cultivated a like I don't actually have to ask permission to do this. Right. You and know? that's the thing is because of the freedom, right? If you couldn't figure out what to do with it as a student, then maybe you didn't get anything out of the process, but if you did, you know, get your bearings, then the point is you came out of it with something that was a lot closer to what graduate school would give you, where you knew how to get stuff done. You didn't need somebody to tell you to do it. Well, and I'll admit, I, uh, when I was in your class, um, I pretended to be a grad student many times, um, probably uh, mostly so, so we were in Olympia for two terms, and then I went to Panama. Um, and uh, this is an example of what you can do, right? I uh, proposed a research project out on this island, 14 kilometers out into the Caribbean. Yep. Uh, I said, I want to work on the pygmy sl- three-toed sloth. And Heather was my advisor. She said, okay. Um, and, uh, you know, we ended up, I um, persuaded a few more students to come with me on this crazy adventure. And we ended up uh, doing the first population census of a critically endangered species. You know, got the thing published, all of that. Um, and I didn't even think about like, oh, you're not supposed to do that as an undergrad. Yeah. Except for when I would try to access like the resources at the Smithsonian Institute in Panama. Um, in which case, they would let me in if I pretended to be a grad student. Um, but undergrads, you know, it was a yeah. tour <laughs> experience. Which- that it's it's funny. I don't know uh, you. I don't know that we ever talked about this, um, or if we did, whether you'll remember it. But I think the reason that you ended up on pygmy slaws actually had to do with um, am I correct that the description of the pygmy sloth was a Charles Handley paper? It was Charles Handley, but that wasn't actually the connection. Oh, it wasn't. Yeah, I was. I was interested in Antillean manatees, so. I started calling all the researchers down there on manatees and I was like, all right, how do I get it? What are the questions? What is, what are people puzzling on? And, uh, I ran into this one guy who said, well, you know, manatees might be hard to tap in with, but there's the sloth. There's the sloth on this on island. This and then yes, the descriptive paper, Charles Handley, yep. who was one of my mentors on bats actually mm-hmm. on Barrow, Colorado Island in Panama. Um, he's now gone, but um, anyway, I think he would have been very pleased that you guys um, went and, and studied this very odd creature on this island um, in the Bocas del Toro, inhospitable little island. But um, yeah, Scudo de Veraguas. Yeah, yeah, way the hell out there. Um, yeah, and and we were talking about phenolic compounds earlier. The the pygmy sloth is a funny puzzle because they seem to specialize on only mangrove leaves. Yeah. And you don't see that, as we were talking about, with grazers and browsers, browsers rather, because they're trying to 
distribute the toxins right. um, amongst many different types. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting puzzle and interesting that you were able, you know, yeah, as an undergraduate, you're able to, you know, not only manage a, an actual research project that was able to get to the point of a, you know, a useful and publishable um, paper, but to do so under really inhospitable conditions, right? That's an amazing accomplishment. Yeah, three months in a pretty remote place. Yeah, pretty remote. Place. But that's what that's what Evergreen enabled. There was no one to say no. Right. Right. You had you had a guiding mentor in your faculty, and as long as you could convince them that, you know, there was there was some hope that you would come through it with something that uh, is worth the education. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I and I learned a lot from that experience. Well, you mentioned um, academic fair, which, to be honest with you, I, ha- I haven't thought about it in some time. But I used to love it's academic fair. It's very stressful fair. as a student. That was oh. the dating game. I used to I used to love it because <laughs> and, uh, most faculty hated it. Right? Mm-hmm. You had to show up on a day when you would otherwise have been free in the afternoon and mm-hmm. sit there for hours. You know, as one student after another would come and sit down in front of you and say, "Well, what, what's your program going to be about?" Uh-huh. Um, but for me, it was an opportunity to, this is going to sound terrible, but um, because our classes were, over, for both Heather and me, our classes were always oversubscribed. And that meant that there was actually something to be accomplished in figuring out what students would be best if they got in there, what yeah. students had the most to gain from it, and what students brought something to the table that would make the programs lively. And so, um, you know, I wouldn't just deliver the same, you know, well, what's your program going to be about? Well, we're going to study this, that, and the other, right? Um, I would use it as an opportunity to figure out who was sitting down in that chair mm-hmm. in front of me and figure out whether or not they were a good fit. And if they were a good fit, I would do everything in my power to try to get them to sign up. Uh-huh. And if they weren't going to be a good fit because they really needed, you know, a syllabus and they needed to know on what day, the, you know, if that was what was going to happen, then I was not, I was doing them a favor by driving oh, them yeah. off, right? Yep. <laughs> um, And so anyway, I, you know, many of the people who took my programs and went on uh, to do really interesting things and to become friends and people that I admire, I met them at Academic Fair as they thought they were interviewing me and I was kind of pushing them around to see whether they could, you know, could handle it and whether or not it was going to be the kind of thing that was to their taste. So anyway, I have have many fond memories of that. Um, Yeah, I remember I had to write a essay on trade-offs in order to get into your class oh were you um you must have been you weren't uh you didn't get in on the normal i was i was late to um uh signing up right and i didn't attend academic fair right oh yep and so then i was assigned an essay assigned (laughs) an essay right um yeah Yeah. that's cool yeah so i mean i don't i don't my hope is that by the time my three little ones are at the age where they're looking for a mentor of that caliber, there's a place where mentors have that freedom. Um, I don't know where that is right now, but it's nowhere right now. Yeah. Um, I, I hope it happens too. I of course have one kid right at that age and one kid a couple of years out. And um, the fact that there's nowhere obvious to send them is so disturbing and you know it is it is evidence of exactly the same kind of short-sightedness as we were discussing with respect to the destruction of all of the things that the beavers had built Mm. into our landscapes because we are effectively sowing the seeds of our undoing by allowing education to be captured by um, ideological agendas and uh, just lunacy Right. I mean, how crazy is it that a place, you know, that produced really great students who were capable of, you know, I mean, look, you've founded an organization. Um, You are now uh, returning to your former professor and teaching him about, uh, you know, important features of the life (laughs) of a mammal, even though he's a mammologist. Right. So anyway, that kind of... um, liberating encounter with education is tremendously important there is you know people totally misunderstand you know evergreen is a public college right right? yeah why which was one of the reasons i could attend 
right. it was on Pell Grant and food stamps, <laughs> you know. And it wasn't a place for rich kids. It's yeah. Not that there weren't a few there. There were. For sure. But it was a place, it was inexpensive to afford. You could, yep. if, if you, you know, if you had a learning disability, it wasn't the end of the world. Because there was 1,100 acres of forest. I came back from Panama. I was like, I'm not going to do a renting a lease thing. And I lived in the forest for the rest of the term. Did you? Oh, you uh, I didn't realize you were I was one of those forest. students. Yeah. Uh, maintained three different lockers and showered in the gym. <laughs> yeah, it, this is one of these things that happens at Evergreen. Mm-hmm. It, it was it was a truly special place, and you know, it, it's it's very upsetting to me that its um, legacy is that the lunacy staged a coup, which it did, but that was not the sum total of the story of the place. And for those wishing to build, you know, higher ed two point oh understanding what evergreen had right would be crucial yeah right if you could take the part that evergreen had right and prune off the part that didn't work right then you've got the seed of something really powerful and you know you're, you're a testament to that and i uh i greatly appreciate what you did with the the freedom that you had uh as a result of going there well thanks um as you're saying that i'm reminded um Kind of the process that Twitter is going through right now, where they seem to be pruning things that aren't working and uh, trying to retain things that work, um, which, yeah, it's kind of a non sequitur, but it, it, I know that you spend a bit of time there, mm-hmm. and so, and I don't, so it'd be kind of interested on your thoughts here. But my experience with that platform and as a public square. Um, I was a little leery of the app, so I had a browser open on my phone, Mm -hmm. and I had um, multiple tabs. Each tab was some thinker that I was interested in their take, right? Because the way Twitter was working, you couldn't actually, you know, you're following 100 people, you couldn't say, these 12 people, I want to check in with what they said, right? But I did that by a bunch of tabs, and that that was my news filter for a long time. Um, until Twitter did away with the ability to open it on a browser in the way I was doing. But the the ability to check in on a daily basis and say, okay, what's Brett saying? What's his brother saying? And then go down the list um, was a powerful news filter. Mm. As I was struggling to understand the world and feeling like I'm being sold a, a bill of goods everywhere I turn, um, the one spot that I was able to find um, uh, a place where I could I could get kind of a, a, a thinking person's perspective, but then across various political spec- spectrum, it, you know, 20 minutes later, I knew what all these various minds were thinking about whatever the issue that had come up was. Um, I thought that that was a really powerful piece that... I think is very promising and that, you know, I'm, I'm curious, like, well, as one of those people, yeah. you know, uh, it, this is a very dangerous moment. And mm-hmm. I did not even think to do what you're discussing doing. It strikes me as, you know, it's tragic that you have to right? what uh-huh. you want is one or a couple of sources of news where they have effectively done that and they have figured out what the various perspectives are and they present it in some way that doesn't require you to kludge together a solution like that. However, that's not the world we live in. So I know when some story is happening, I am constantly in the, the bind that I then think, all right, which news outlet is liable to be able to report that story straight? I want to know what's going on. There's no news outlet that is capable of reporting all stories as straight as they can get them. They all have a bent. And so the point is on that story, right, is that a story that the New York Times can afford to report? Or is that a story that they will be mm-hmm. telling me complete nonsense? And so you're, you're describing a solution to that problem built of individuals. Right. right. Here are some individuals who... Um, you know, have a track record. I'm not going to listen to any of them in individually. I'm exactly. To... The power is in the aggregate and yeah. then broadly spreading out who you're listening to. So what I would say is I am very hopeful about what Musk seems to be up to and I'm very nervous about it. 
because a lot depends on him getting it right. And I guess I hope that he will hear what you were doing and hear that it is no longer possible because the app effectively forbids it. So driving people to the app is so much a part right. of Twitter's yeah, business Yeah, if I open it on the browser, it says, well, we've got an app. You know, you should use the app. Right. <laughs> so the question is, look, there is no reason as far as I can tell that the app, since Musk does appear to be interested in people using this as a source of news, which sounds crazy, but in this era, I think it's actually the best hope we've got. Um, there's no reason that that couldn't be done in the app. What you need is control. And in fact, many of us have been in a sort of private conversation about what might be done to make uh, an environment that didn't drive us crazy. And one of the things that might be done is the ability to peer through anybody's eyes at the thing. Right? Mm -hmm. Part of the problem with something like Twitter is that I know what it shows me, right. but I have to bend over backwards to figure out how well that matches what it shows somebody else. And I certainly can't see, you know, I, I don't have a set of controls that allow me to go in and say, you know. Toggle. Right. Yeah. Let, let me see this through the eyes of an NPR listener, right? Yeah. I'd love to know, mm -hmm. right? But I, I can't do it. I'm too trapped in my own, uh, my own bubble. Um, so anyway, the idea of you were kludging something together, it's clear that there's such a value. It's clear that Musk wants people to be using it this way, and there's now a structural obstacle to doing it. Maybe that results in him thinking, huh, how can we build that into the app so that instead of, um, you know, sh being uh, short-sighted and, you know, milking people's attention, we can be farsighted and we can give them the opportunity to do something that is so valuable from the point of view of building their perspective on the world that that will keep them around long term, even if they look at it for fewer hours. Right? Yeah, exactly. Because you were doing work for me, right? If I tune in to, to 12 perspectives, I don't know how many hours you spent. Too training. many. <laughs> Too many. But I am, I am a parasitic uh, recipient, <laughs> benefiter from the amount of hours you spent coming up with your, and I, I read it in 30 seconds and then I'm moving on to the next person and the next person. And that is a powerful, that's a powerful tool. Yep. Yeah. Now you say, I know you're joking when you say parasitic. I have to tell you though, that it is exactly the opposite of the right thing because, mm -hmm. um, in my case, I confess I would be better off if it wasn't on Twitter, mm -hmm. but I can't not be. And the reason that I am there is because it is necessary to do the kind of sense making that I do. And it is necessary um, to provide something useful to other people, right? If people are going to listen to what I have to say, then it ought to be informed. And there isn't a good place to go get informed that doesn't look like a kludge. So I use it as a tool. Um, I'd love a better tool. And I'd love for people like you who are using it as a tool um, to be able to do it deliberately, right? To right. just set in yep. motion, here, here are the perspectives I would like mm -hmm. to be able to scan between. So I, anyway. I want a tool, not an experience. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And actually this, uh, this goes to one of my, I won't call it a pet peeve, but one of my concerns is that too many phenomena that where we interact with something have been turned into consumer phenomena. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to be a consumer of Twitter, right? right. You want a tool with which you can um, discover something, interact in ways that are useful, and turn it off at the point that it's not benefiting you. And, uh, you know, it will be the first of its kind if it becomes that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, this has been fabulous. It's great to see you, and it's great to see you making your way in the world and on such a important, if strange, topic <laughs> as uh, beaver well-being and terraforming, terraforming of the earth to our benefit. So, Jacob Shockey, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.